Chapter 830 She had never intended to hide her strength. The advanced archives had a fully metallic interior design. Although they called it an archive room, it was actually more like a large safe. Nora looked at the room full of technology. The room was more than 5,000 square feet and there were many shelves on the walls. There were small boxes on all the shelves. Each box was marked with a label. Nora looked over. From the outside all the way to the inside, there were hundreds almost a thousand of them. In the middle was a long table with only paper and pens on it. It was very neat and clean. The files in the advanced archives were all highly important confidential material that mustn't be leaked. For confidentiality's sake, they had never been digitized, so as to prevent hacking attempts from hackers like Q and Y. The files here were never loaned out either. One had to read all the files they wanted to check out in the room itself. Therefore, there were elites from various industries seated at the long table at the moment. Most of them were postgraduate students working on projects with their mentors. Some lecturers also had to come over to refer to the materials. Only one or two undergraduates were eligible to access the room. Nora didn't make much noise when she entered but she was startled when she saw the room full of people. She certainly hadn't expected it to be so lively in here. After she entered, a student on duty asked, Who are you? How did you get in? Nora pondered for a moment. The student on duty seemed to have a very wary look in his eyes. There were only so many people who could come in here to study and refer to the materials, so he would definitely know who had access and who didn't. Therefore, she probably wouldn't be able to pretend that she had come in to read the books here. Thus, Nora simply replied, I came the wrong way. After speaking, she wanted to leave. However, she was stopped by the student. Miss, you can't go. You must explain clearly why you're here, otherwise, we have grounds to suspect that you are here to steal important data from the school. The advanced archives were Stav University's crucial capital that had allowed it to establish its position and be ranked third among all the universities in the world. Thus, the security here would undoubtedly be very strict. Nora looked down at the card in her hand. She was about to explain that she had found a card and came in without knowing what this place was when a low and deep voice suddenly reached them. How did you find this place? When Nora turned, she immediately saw Kelvin's heavily made up face. He had eyeshadow on and his eyeliner was drawn long, which made him look even more bewitching than usual. His complexion was very fair from all the makeup but the thick foundation was surprisingly not cakey. After not seeing him for two days, the fellow's skin condition seemed to have improved. Nora didn't understand why a thought like that would pop up in her mind at a critical moment like this. The next moment, though, Kelvin looked at the student on duty and said with a sense of resignation, she's my fan. The student sighed at once. I knew it. Kelvin, we agreed to let you shoot here, but only for half an hour, and you are also not allowed to touch any of our stuff here. But your fans are even breaking in now. Kelvin was very tall. He leaned against the wall lazily and said, Sorry, since she's my fan, I'll deal with her myself. After speaking, he walked straight toward the door. He grabbed her wrist as he passed by Nora. Nora was dumbfounded. She stared blankly at the hand holding her wrist. His hand, the warmth of his palm was very similar to Justin's yet at the same time, it was also different because there was a burn scar on the back of his hand. Kelvin had indeed scalded himself. The incident took place just a week before Justin had faked his death. Therefore, he was not Justin. After leaving the archives, Nora came back to her senses and shook off Kelvin's hand. She asked, why did you help me? When, Kelvin, heard this, the look in his eyes turned a little deeper. Damn it, those eyes were looking a little like Justin's again. Nora frowned. The next moment, she heard him chuckle and say, didn't I already tell you? Some men like playing with their sister-in-law. When the man spoke, he bent over slightly and leaned close to her ear. His breath when he spoke tickled her neck. What do you think, Nora? Won't you consider me? Nora took a step back and avoided his seduction. Then, she immediately bent her knee to hit him in the crotch. Shocked, Kelvin quickly jumped back a step. Only then did he manage to avoid the woman's attack. 
With a sharp look in her eyes, Nora said sloppily but murderously, keep a distance of three feet from me from now on. Otherwise, don't hold it against me if my arms or legs itch for some action. After saying that, she turned and left. After the woman disappeared into the distance, Kelvin touched his head. His Nora was still as straightforward and explosive as always. Wasn't she a little too harsh? He had almost been need. Nora went home. Nothing special happened that night except Liam coming over to give them a cake in the evening. Renee made it, I hope you guys like it. By the way, I managed to keep my job. Mrs. Long's son has been fired. The landlord also approached Mrs. Long today and informed her that she was going to evict them. Mrs. Long has been ranting and swearing all afternoon but the landlord is very powerful and isn't someone she can afford to offend, so she has agreed to move out in three days. Liam looked at Nora tentatively as he spoke. He wanted to know if she was the person whom Fred had offended but shouldn't have. But the woman's expression was so calm and peaceful that he couldn't tell anything from it. Liam could only return disappointed. Nora didn't care about such things, though. All she wanted at the moment was a good night's sleep. The next day was the cellular and molecular biology examination. As soon as Nora entered, Oscar frowned and looked at her, her expression as though she had expected better from Nora. She handed her book to Nora and said, the exam is starting soon, you'd better take a quick look. Otherwise, you won't pass. Nora, before she could even decline, the person next to her said, it's useless even if she looks at it. Now, yeah, there's no way she'll do well in the exam. All the exchange students that come here every year from the NYU School of Medicine's Department of Biology are really lousy. The NYU School of Medicine is too lousy. Even though they are a top medical university in the U.S., they are still far behind in biomedical engineering. Yeah, I think so too. The group of people expressed their concern for her. Oscar was also anxious. The girl sat next to Nora and said, can you please take a look? If you get an E, it'll embarrass us too. Unlike most universities, the grading system here ranged from A to E where A represented, excellent. B represented, good. C represented a pass. D represented a fail. And E represented extremely unsatisfactory performance. When Nora heard this, she raised her eyebrows and pushed the book back to Oscar. Right after, she curled her lips into a smile and said, Nah, that's not gonna happen. Oscar was stunned. What? Are you saying you won't read it or? Before she could finish, Nora said, What I mean is, the NYU School of Medicine won't score badly. After all, she had never intended to hide her strength. Since only, excellent, people could openly go to the archives to read the material there, she would become an, excellent, person. Chapter 831 Exam But when Oscar heard what Nora said, she thought she was just trying to push herself beyond her abilities. Oscar hurriedly explained, it's not that we look down on the NYU School of Medicine, but for so many years, all the exchange students that come from your school really take last place all the time. They have never produced any respectable grades. This was also the reason why no one in the Department of Biomedicine wanted to be an exchange student. The New York University School of Medicine's Department of Biomedicine was not ranked in the country nor was the university the best specialist institution in the country. Their best courses were in surgery, medicine, and other specializations to do with medical skills. They were relatively weak in pharmaceuticals. On the other hand, Stav University was the best school in the world when it came to biomedical engineering. This was also the most difficult course to get into at Stav University every year. There was undoubtedly a gap between the two. Although no one knew why the two schools had an exchange program each year, it was indeed a form of torture to have the biomedicine majors study here. Oscar thought that the student's comments had hurt Nora's self-esteem, so she comforted her and said, your grade in the exam is what matters the most, nothing else matters. Lisa, you really disappoint me. It's not bad for one to be poor, what's worse is when one is poor and still tries to defend their hollow pride. If I were you, I would try my best to absorb knowledge and use my best grades to shut them up instead of giving up on myself like what you're doing. After Oscar finished speaking, she took back her book. Lisa, do you know why the counselor asked me to guide you? 
It's not because my grades are the best, rather, it's because I'm the most hardworking. The counselor does treat you well. We are all her students, so she doesn't look down on you. On the contrary, you're trying to prove yourself everywhere and maintain your pitiful self-esteem. You're a really sad person. After saying that, Oscar didn't look at her anymore. She had her own form of arrogance too. Although she found Lisa's standard in the specialized course poor, she was still willing to help her. Oscar never looked down on students who were poor in learning. She only looked down on students who were obviously poor in learning yet still refused to work hard. Nora wanted to explain, but the lecturer had already entered. Let's start the exam. Nora could only shut up. The exam commenced. Oscar took her exams even more seriously than studying. Only through exams were her efforts reflected each time. She liked the feeling of taking first place. The exam questions were not difficult for Oscar, so after she finished the multiple choice questions at the front, she subconsciously glanced at Nora only to see that she had already turned a page. Oscar frowned. Did she not know how to do any of them? So she just randomly picked a few options. Oscar shook her head. Was she such a sensitive person? She lowered her head and continued with the paper. There was a question in the middle that stumped Oscar a little. She frowned as she contemplated the question wanting to deduce what the answer was. She had two ideas in mind but she didn't know which one was correct. After thinking about it for a long time, she finally chose one and wrote it down. Right after she wrote down the answer to the question, she heard footsteps. Oscar raised her head abruptly to see Nora getting up and submitting her papers. Oscar. Her expression turned even more awful and her contempt for Nora grew even stronger. She liked people who worked hard and disliked people who gave up easily even more. She still had two pages left to complete but that woman had already submitted her papers. She must have completely given up on the exam, right? Not only was she poor at her studies but she didn't even work hard and relied only on guesswork for her exams. On top of that, she even submitted her papers ahead of time. Even her attitude towards her studies wasn't respectable anymore. She had completely given up on herself. An expression as though she had expected better from Nora came over Oscar's countenance. She took a deep breath and continued with the exam. After the exam, when she left the classroom, she happened to see the counselor waiting for her outside. At the sight of her, the counselor asked, Oscar, where's Lisa? A displeased Oscar replied, she handed in her papers ahead of time, she already left. The counselor looked at her. Did you guys look down on her? Oscar, this is an academic institution. We mustn't look down on anyone here, okay? Oscar said with dissatisfaction, I didn't look down on her. I just look down on people who are poor at their studies. After speaking, she requested, can I stop being her guide? We don't get along and we'll never be able to work together. The counselor frowned. Oh, have you given up on Lisa, dear? You were the best student in the class. If even you give up on her, then what is she going to do? Oscar's heart softened but after thinking about it carefully, she nonetheless hardened her heart and said, Ma'am, I didn't give up on her, she's the one who gave up on herself. I'm not going to study with such an unmotivated person. The counselor immediately said, What must she do for you to help her? Oscar, I believe you can still give it a try. Oscar shook her head. That's impossible, I'm not interested in her anymore. Besides, I want to take the postgraduate entrance exam. Ma'am, you know me. If you want me to guide her, well, unless she does better than me in the exam. The counselor immediately hung her head. You know that's impossible. You are the top student among the juniors and always score the best in exams. Oscar shook her head and walked off with her school bag in her arms. So, there's no way I'll ever do that again. I'm going to the library to read, please don't take up my time anymore. Oscar left, leaving only the counselor standing there as she sighed. What was Lisa supposed to do if Oscar refused to guide her anymore? What a headache. After thinking about it, the counselor decided to go to the cellular and molecular bioscience professor's office. She asked, Professor, how did Lisa do in the exam? The professor waved dismissively and said, They've only just finished the exam, so I haven't looked at the papers yet. 
The counselor asked, can you take out Lisa's test paper and take a look first? The counselor only hoped that Lisa wouldn't score too badly in the exam. If Nora could get AC, then she could try talking to Oscar again. Chapter 832 How did she do in the exam? When Professor Wilson heard the counselor, he couldn't help but shrug. The papers have only just been collected. They haven't been given to me yet, so. He couldn't see Nora's test paper, either. The counselor sighed. Never mind then. Professor Wilson asked curiously, are her grades very good? I happen to need two undergraduates as assistants in my lab. If her grades are excellent, then I can consider her for the position. Oh, no, the counselor explained, she's an exchange student from America. Oscar doesn't want to guide her anymore, so I was thinking that if she could at least score AC, then I can try talking to Oscar about it again. Upon hearing this, Professor Wilson waved and said, oh, an exchange student from America. The students from that school are terrible, so I doubt she can score a C. Even in her best condition, the highest she can score is probably just a D. I'll go a little easy on her. The counselor nodded. She thought for a while and suddenly said, Professor, you said just now that your lab needs assistance from the undergraduates, right? You'll definitely want Oscar, so why don't you take Lisa too? As an exchange student, everyone looks down on her. If you let her help out at the lab, maybe she'll be motivated to do better. Professor Wilson thought for a while and shook his head. I only want Oscar. My experiment requires the assistants to go to the archives to refer to the materials there, so I didn't even pick that many postgraduate students. It is impossible for me to accept someone who doesn't know anything into the team. The counselor frowned and said, but our school treats the exchange students so coldly every year, which reflects really badly on us. This year, the school has ordered me to treat Lisa well. Besides, Lisa is so pretty, she's the prettiest among all the exchange students I have seen. She has an indescribable mysterious feeling about her. Before she could finish, Professor Wilson interrupted her. I see, you want me to accept her so that it looks like our course values the exchange students, right? But there are many professors conducting experiments, it doesn't necessarily have to be me. I can recommend someone. The counselor blinked. You mean, the university's deserter, of course. Didn't that guy come back this year? The one who takes a salary from the school every month but doesn't do his job. I heard that he plans to set up an experiment lab. Can't you just shove Lisa into his lab? The counselor understood at once. You're referring to Professor Myers. But Professor Myers was the best professor of microbiology in the past. Will he accept an exchange student? Wilson smiled. Wayne Myers is also from America, so who knows? You can try asking him. Besides, you said it yourself, that was all in the past. Do you think he is still the best when more than 20 years have already passed? I heard that his lab hasn't gotten any investors so far and neither have any students applied to be under him. When Wayne disappeared more than 20 years ago, everyone had said that he left to go into business. This was because he had kept asking people from the university's School of Economics and Business Management business-related questions. It was said that his company didn't do very well, so he had returned to campus. Many looked down on him upon his return. Everyone privately mocked him for living in the past and thinking that he was still the best microbiology professor, which had made him set extremely strict standards for students applying to join his projects. As a result, he still hadn't established a team for his project. Additionally, no one was investing in his project. The counselor found Wilson's suggestion perfunctory but when she thought about how Oscar had rejected Lisa, she was afraid that even Lisa would give up on herself if she didn't arrange for Lisa to be assigned to a lab. She could only say, I'll try talking to him. For Lisa, she had to bite the bullet and give it a go. After saying this, she turned and saw a cranky figure at the door. Wayne stared at Wilson. The two could be said to be old friends. Wilson had competed with him back then but he didn't expect him to have become so despicable. Didn't he just take care of Idelian Pharmaceuticals for Ms. Yvette for a few years? Yet they were now taking him for a nobody. Air no, they were too much. Wayne was a chatterbox from the start and was incredibly naggy. He was so furious that he started ranting. 
Wilson, you piece of garbage, how dare you look down on me like that? You couldn't catch up with me back then, no matter how hard you tried. I was in first place while you were the perennial second, yet now you're shoving a student you don't want to me. Do you think I will take them? You, hash percent at. Wayne ranted at him for a whole ten minutes without any pause in between, causing both Wilson and the counselor to be dumbfounded. When Wayne finally stopped, the counselor hurriedly said, Professor Myers, that's not the case. Lisa is a good student. Before she could finish, Wayne retorted furiously, do you think there is something wrong with my brain? Would I accept someone Wilson doesn't want? I'm not stupid. I, hash at percent. He scolded Wilson for 10 minutes without any pause, again. After he was done, he became thirsty, so he picked up a glass and poured himself a glass of water. Wilson glanced at the counselor and suddenly said, since Myers doesn't want her either, then let's just forget it. American students are poor in their studies anyway, so neither of us would want them in our labs, isn't that right, Myers? His provocation angered Wayne instantly. Fuck you, who are you looking down on? I'm an American myself. American students are not poor in their studies at all. Wilson waved and said, the facts are right in front of you. I don't want that American student and neither do you. If American students are really that excellent, then why wouldn't you want them? Wayne, who had been checkmated, was a little at a loss for words. Just like the ones here, there are good and bad students in America. How can you lump them all together? Wilson said, but Lisa is already the best student there, yet neither you nor I want her, so, I can only say that American students are simply too lousy in biomedical engineering. When Wayne became the best microbiology professor back then, he had made his country proud. There might not be any borders in science but there were among scientists. Now that Wilson was driving him into a corner like this, would he be able to bear it? He immediately said, who says I don't want her? I want her. I just don't want your rejects, that's all. Ha, huh, but if you let me pick from all the students in the class, I would definitely pick her. What's her name again? The counselor hurriedly replied, Lisa. Wayne nodded. Yes, Lisa. She is the most pleasing to the eye among all the students in the class. I'll take her. Students from America are not inferior in any way at all. Wilson smiled. Myers, you have to think through this. That student's grades are very poor, you know. Ha, huh, just because she has poor grades doesn't mean that she's not talented. Maybe she's just not good at exams. Wilson, you are being biased by evaluating a student like that. Besides, they've only just finished the exam, so their grades aren't even out yet. How are you so sure that her grades are bad? Wayne was puffing himself up at his own cost right now. No matter what, he had to accept Lisa into his lab team today. He mustn't let anyone think that American students were totally unwanted here. At the very worst, he'd just let her mooch off the team. While he was thinking about it, the test papers from the exam were delivered to the office. Wilson's eyes lit up. The test papers are here. Let's find Lisa's and take a look. Didn't you want to know whether Lisa would get a D or an E just now? The counselor. She didn't want to know any more. When the counselor proposed to let Lisa join a lab project, she had really only done it for the students' interests and only wanted to boost her confidence. She didn't expect it to turn into an excuse for Wilson and Wayne to fight. She was extremely grateful to Wayne for accepting the student, so she didn't want to embarrass him. But just as she was about to speak, Wilson had already found Lisa's paper from among the stack of test papers. He smiled and said, come on, let's see just how, excellent, this student from America is. He sounded mocking when he said, excellent. After speaking, he even looked at Wayne and said, come on, Myers, let's take a look together. Chapter 833 Face Slapped by the Grades Wayne's gaze fell on the test paper and he immediately said, I have something on, so I'll have to go now. Then, he turned and started walking to the door. Wilson called out to him and said with a smile, Hey Myers, what's the matter? Are you worried that your heart won't be able to handle her exam results? Don't worry, I'm really good at CPR. Intense sarcasm oozed from the big and tall man. Wayne stood at the door with his back to him. 
Suddenly, he turned his head to the back and said, Wilson, you are still as superficial as you were back then. A student's quality should never be judged by their exam scores, this is our school's motto, isn't it? Wilson's expression changed at once but he nevertheless sneered and said, then what are you afraid of? Wayne coughed and said, what am I afraid of? I've never been afraid of anything, I'm just really busy. I have an appointment with a potential investor. That's the most important thing at the moment, isn't it? After saying that, he ran away. In some academic aspects, the New York University School of Medicine students were indeed rather weak. If Lisa were an exchange student from Stanford University or Harvard University, it might not have been this bad. But since he already knew what the outcome would be like, why stay and be humiliated? Wayne knew all this very clearly, that was why he had run away at once. Wilson, the counselor. An infuriated Wilson broke into a huge rant. That guy is still as shameless as ever. He always says certain things in a highfalutin manner to highlight how noble he is, when in fact, he is a despicable and shameless villain. Ha, huh, so he's refusing to look at the grades. Then all the more I'm going to look at Lisa's grades. After I mark her papers, please send them to Meyer's office. He should at least be aware of his student's level of mastery in the basics, right? After saying that, a vicious Wilson lowered his head and looked at the neat and clean test paper. The answer to the first question was option C. On the paper, Lisa had picked option C. The answers were to be shaded on the answer sheet. Wilson curled his lips disdainfully. Well, the first question was really easy. It wasn't surprising that she would get it right. If she got even the first question wrong, then she would have had no hope for the rest of the exam. He then looked at the second question, the answer was option B. She had gotten it right again. Well, this was normal too. Next came the third question, the sixth, and the twentieth question. She had gotten all the multiple choice questions right. Wilson involuntarily straightened his back. He quickly looked at the fill in the blank questions, which all turned out to be correct again. He turned the page and looked at it. As this was the final exam for the semester, the questions were all very difficult. Wilson had been worried that even Oscar wouldn't be able to get them all correct, but from start to finish, Lisa had gotten all the questions right. In particular, the optional bonus question, its difficulty level was very high and was a topic that could only be studied at the postgraduate level. But, she had gotten that right too. As Wilson went through the paper, he swallowed and looked up at the counselor blankly. When the counselor caught a glimpse of his expression, she immediately became nervous. Professor Wilson, is it very bad? Did she get? D. Wilson smiled wryly and replied, you really don't know your student at all. The counselor misunderstood even further. She was so anxious that she was about to cry. Surely it can't be an E, right? If someone got an E for the exam, she would also be held responsible for it. The counselor wanted the whole class to perform well. No one was to be left behind. The counselor hurriedly said, Professor Wilson, this student only transferred in at the end of the semester, so it is normal for her to be unable to keep up. Can you not give her an E? Can we let her take a makeup exam after giving her some time to study? No, she got an A. A plus. The counselor. She was stunned. What? Wilson tossed her test paper aside. Wait a minute, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with my test paper. Maybe it's too easy. He felt that he might have miscalculated the difficulty of the paper, so he took out Oscar's test paper and started to evaluate it. Oscar got a multiple choice question and a fill in the blank question wrong. In addition, she didn't correctly answer the bonus question. Wilson. He went limp and leaned back on the chair. He raised his head blankly and said, If I say that I want Lisa now, do you think Myers will give her to me? Of course not. Wayne was not to be trifled with. The counselor and Wilson looked at each other. Wilson sneered and said, HMPH, what's the use of doing well in one test? No matter how much of a star student she is, she is still just an undergraduate. Undergraduates can only be assistants in the lab. She won't be of any help to our core experiments at all. Nora was completely unaware that something like that had taken place in the school, let alone the fact that she was about to bump into Wayne again after she came to Switzerland. 
After she handed in her test paper, she wandered around the school trying to find a way to enter the archives. But in the end, she accidentally spotted Kelvin and his crew filming in the distance again. Nora, Stav University covered an area of 5,000 hectares. It stood to reason that it wouldn't be easy for anyone to run into each other in such a large place. This sure was a small world. The corners of Nora's lips spasmed a little and she turned to leave. But the moment she turned, she accidentally bumped into someone. Sorry, the tall man immediately said. Then, when he looked at her, he exclaimed, Hey, it's you. What a coincidence, we've met again. Nora looked at the man in front of her. He had a strong and muscular frame and well-defined facial features, he gave off a very bright and cheerful feeling. Seeing the blank look on her face, the man laughed and said, Jack, I'm Jack. I almost hit you when I was playing basketball the other day but you managed to block it. Nora, who finally recalled the incident, asked, Do you need something? Jack grinned and asked, Do you have a boyfriend? Nora. In the distance, Kelvin, who was filming, had already spotted Nora at a glance when she was walking over. The man had to do a lot of work for his filming today after all, Kelvin, had been slacking off the last few days. Therefore, he didn't have any plans to look for his sister-in-law at all. However, he didn't expect a boy to stop her and ask such a question. Kelvin smirked. Ha! Huh. Was he trying to court his sister-in-law? He sure thought really highly of himself. Just as he was thinking about it, he heard Nora reply, I used to have one but not anymore. Kelvin. Jack was surprised. Did you guys break up? Nora shook his head. No, he's dead. Kelvin. Jack became even more astonished but he quickly recovered and said, Well, that's a shame. Can I pursue you? Chapter 834 There's something wrong with him. In universities, students fell in love quickly and were also very straightforward about it. Nora was surprisingly very calm about his confession. After all, over the years, she had received a lot of confessions. This was true due to her good-looking facial features even when she was fat. Just as she was about to reject him, a man's voice came from behind her. She turned around to see that Kelvin, who was filming, had come behind her at some point. The man asked sarcastically, are Cherry, Pete, and Xander doing well? Nora, was the man especially keeping a watch on her? Didn't he have work to do? Was the crew this nonchalant that he could just stop filming whenever he wanted to? The corners of Nora's lips spasmed. Jack was a little surprised. Who are Cherry, Pete, and Xander? Kelvin raised his eyebrows, looked at Nora, and grinned. He was cold and standoffish to others, but when facing Nora, this younger cousin of Justin's was just like a little devil. There wasn't the familiar feeling she had felt when she talked to him the other time, though. Nora was already planning to say that she had three lovely children, but... Kelvin had interrupted her. Now that Jack was also asking, she replied, they are my adorable children. Jack. Stunned, Jack looked at Nora incredulously. Oh my god, you really have three children. Are you even legal yet? You look sixteen at best. When Kelvin heard him, he snickered and muttered, Tisk, this man sure is smooth. Which part of you looks like you're sixteen when you are already so old? Nora. A puzzled Jack asked, What did you say? I didn't catch that. Nora replied, He said you say some really nice things. Really? Jack was a little embarrassed. That's a compliment, right? I've always been like this. 2. 11. Nora kept quiet. Jack looked at Nora again and said, Your children must be really cute. If there's time, I would like to meet them. So, can I pursue you? Kelvin frowned. She already had three children yet he still wanted to pursue her. Nora also raised her eyebrows, though, she rejected him again, No, you don't have to. I have no plans to date anyone for the time being. Upon hearing this, Kelvin breathed a sigh of relief. At least that woman knows what's good for her. Ah, all right. Jack looked a little down, but he quickly looked at her again. I've asked around. You're an exchange student who just came to our school, right? How about I show you around the campus? His suggestion piqued Nora's interest. Her eyes narrowed a little. It was said that there were many mysterious corners in universities that only boys knew about. 
Perhaps there might be things that Jack found different or extraordinary about the school. Thus, Nora nodded happily and said, sure. She followed behind Jack and was about to leave. Kelvin was dumbfounded. He grabbed Nora's arm and said angrily, how can you go with him? He obviously has designs on you. In a situation like this, shouldn't you keep your distance from him for Justin's sake? Nora's brows drew together. She didn't understand why Kelvin had suddenly become so impetuous. However, Kelvin was now giving her the same feeling she had gotten from him the first time they had met. As expected, the bit of familiar feeling she had gotten from him, which had reminded her of Justin, was all just an illusion. She grabbed Kelvin's hand and made him release her with just a bit of force. Nora then said, don't you get along poorly with Justin? Shouldn't you be very happy to see this? Kelvin. After saying that, Nora walked over to Jack. Let's go. Kelvin practically flipped out after the two walked away. At the side, the director and his assistant came over and said, Hey Kelvin, it's time to shoot. Kelvin snapped, shoot, go away. The assistant was distressed. For some reason, it was as if Kelvin had become a completely different person the last two days. Although his acting skills were not bad, they didn't quite fit the role. After being off form for two days, his condition had finally recovered today, so the director was planning to shoot a little more to make up for the poor performance the past two days. What was Kelvin's problem this time? His problem. Kelvin was in a huge panic. His sister-in-law was about to be stolen by someone else. How would he possibly be in the mood to shoot? Justin was the one here the last two days. By right, he was supposed to be making up for the scenes he shot today. He picked up his cell phone, walked to the side, and dialed a number. No name was displayed on the screen. As soon as the other side answered, he whispered, Justin, you've been cuckolded. The deep male voice paused for a moment before he finally asked, what's going on? Kelvin repeated parts of the conversation between Nora and Jack. Then, he became indignant and said, she clearly knows that Jack has designs on her, yet she still went to tour the campus with him. That means she's neither rejecting nor accepting him, that's total scumbag behavior. It's fortunate. That you've already separated from her, Justin. You should have a good look at her true colors while the two of you are not married yet. The man opposite fell silent for a while before he finally asked, did she really go off to tour the campus with Jack? Yes. Kelvin was furious. He was about to rant a little more when the other man said, something is wrong with Jack. Keep an eye on him. Kelvin was taken aback for a moment. Then, he became dumbfounded. Of course there's something wrong with him, he has already started to pursue Nora, no, wait, you mean. Justin's low and deep voice slowly reached him. Nora must have discovered something. That's why she left with him. 4. An indescribable expression came over Kelvin's face. Why are you still finding excuses for her? Justin, how come I never realized that you're someone who can't think straight once you fall in love? Get lost. The other man paused for a while before he added, don't get in her way. Was he telling him not to get in the way of her dating other guys? As expected, Justin was hopeless. Kelvin took a deep breath and became even more displeased with Nora. On the other side, Nora walked around the campus casually with Jack, who then asked for her contact information. After the two exchanged numbers, Jack left. Nora narrowed her eyes as she stared at him from the back. While she was musing, a voice reached her. Lisa. Nora turned and saw Oscar approaching. The woman, who was holding a book, followed her gaze and also looked at Jack's retreating back. She said with dissatisfaction, you are here to study, not to fall in love. How can you? She'd only just said that when the counselor spotted them and came over excitedly. Oscar, Lisa, you are both here. Nice timing, because I have news for you girls. Professor Wilson has already marked Lisa's papers, her grades are out. Oscar immediately said, hurry up and tell us, so that knows where she stands. Chapter 835A+. Oscar was a very conservative girl. From what she knew, being able to enter Stav University to study was what many people dreamed of. She was not here to date but to learn. She did not even have enough time to study usually, so how could she date? 
Therefore, she despised university students dating. Especially Lisa. She was from New York and her results were bad, to begin with. As an exchange student, not only did she not have any self-awareness but she was even being pursued not long after she came. She handed in the papers so early to go on a date with this person, right? Oscar's disdain for Nora reached the limit. She even reached the point of never talking to this person again. She was afraid that she would be affected by her laziness. When the counselor heard Oscar's words, she misunderstood. She smiled. Yes, I was about to tell you that I want you to continue helping her. No, I refuse, Oscar said bluntly. I can't help her with anything. The counselor instantly misunderstood what she meant and said with a smile, do you know her results? Although you can't teach her, you can still help her around the university. Every time an exchange student came to the school, the counselor would get a student from the same dormitory to help guide the student. After all, other than studying, there were many other matters to take care of. Exchange students were not too sure about such things. It was better to have someone guide them. This was also why Oscar had said last time that if Norris' results surpassed hers, she would help her again. However, Oscar did not understand what the counselor meant. I don't need to see it to know her results. I came to this school to study, not to waste time, so I rejected her. I won't be with a person who isn't in the mood to study and thinks too much. She affects my life too much, I only want to be with students who have good grades. You should have heard of the saying, one is marked by the company one keeps. I don't want my results to fall behind. She was always straightforward. She was pretty good to Nora previously. Although her words were not very nice, she still took care of her. She was not bad at heart but her mouth was unforgiving. When the counselor heard this, she finally realized that Oscar was acting the same as her. They both had thought that Nora was a bad student. She hurriedly explained, but Lisa is. Before she could finish, Nora interrupted the counselor. I'm sorry. I've caused you trouble you don't have to do it anymore in the future. With that, she looked at the counselor. I'm already very familiar with the school. I don't need anyone to show me around. Thank you. Is there anything else? The counselor's eyes widened and she was stunned. She shook her head in a daze. No. Okay, I'll get going then. Nora left. Looking at her calm back, the counselor could not help but think of the paper Professor Wilson had reviewed. It was clean, very clean, and there were no traces of calculation. What kind of person was this mysterious American girl? For a moment, the counselor could not understand. As she was thinking, Oscar pursed her lips and said, Counselor, I only want to partner with someone with good grades and one who loves to study. Please don't waste my time with such a person next time. With that, she raised her chin proudly and prepared to leave. The counselor looked at her and suddenly sighed. She asked, Do you know what Lisa's grade was this time? I'm not interested in whether she gets a D or an E. The counselor, No, she didn't. Oscar was stunned for a moment but she quickly came back to her senses. Is it C? Most of the exchange students from New York University School of Medicine in our school get Ds. It's no wonder she's so arrogant. The counselor pursed his lips. She got an A+. She got the only perfect score in the class. What? Was she hallucinating? Chapter 836 There's still Lisa. She frowned. Did you see something wrong? The counselor sighed. No, Professor Wilson personally graded the papers. Oh, he even evaluated yours. Congratulations, you're an A2 but it's an A. Oscar. She knew that she could not get full marks this time because the questions were especially difficult. She was very satisfied with this result. But why did Lisa get full marks? She was stunned. The counselor patted her shoulder. I know you love to study and you're very hardworking but I keep feeling that you're the type to bury your head in books. When I heard that Lisa scored full marks, do you know what my first reaction was? Oscar shook her head. The counselor sighed. What you lack is a proper technique for studying. I originally thought that while showing Lisa around, you could start observing how she studies. A person like her is clearly talented. You two could compliment each other. You said that you would have to lead her, but actually, I wanted her to lead you. After all, Lisa was leaving after three months.
No matter how good her results were, she was not a student of their school. The counselor was also selfish. But now, the counselor was momentarily at a loss for words. Oscar was also stunned. She suddenly turned her head to look into the distance and saw that Nora had just turned a corner in front of her. She had disappeared. At this moment, she suddenly realized what she had lost. Dash. Nora did not care too much about Oscar and the counselor's thoughts. Oscar liked the hard-working type. Yes, Nora was born far from this type. If she had the time to work hard, she might as well sleep more. Therefore, since their personalities did not match, it was better for them to separate. Moreover, she was not really there to learn. Her goal was the V-16. No matter what, she would never forget this. Nora was about to walk forward when she suddenly saw a few familiar faces walking over. She stopped in her tracks and suddenly turned around. The few familiar faces were none other than the senior executives of NTT. The person in the lead was Royce, youngest and second in command. He was in charge of the company's investments. Behind him were a few employees from the investment department in the NTT. They did not notice Nora, but she was afraid that Royce would recognize her, so she hid her figure. She could not let her aunt know that she was back. Otherwise, going by her aunt's exaggerated personality, everyone in Stav University would know about her. She did not want to attract attention right now. After all, there were five psychopaths like, Truman, watching her look for the V-16. It was better to keep a low profile. Nora avoided them but she did not notice that among the staff behind Royce, Liam was looking away in confusion. Why did he seem to have seen that poor neighbor, the mother of three children, Lisa? Liam was American and American faces were more recognizable to him. Especially Nora's bright and beautiful looks. She was stunning at a glance and was difficult to miss. Therefore, he felt that he could not have seen wrongly. Furthermore, Renee had said that Lisa was studying at Stav University. Although it was rare for college students to date, have children, and even get married, it was not unheard of. There were one or two such people every year. Therefore, Liam did not think much of it. However, why was Lisa avoiding him? Liam shook his head and looked away in confusion. He entered the office ahead with Royce. As he walked, the person beside him asked, This project is clearly not outstanding enough, why did you come here? Royce said, Because I want to give him a chance. Wayne was sitting there in the office. When he saw them, he immediately stood up eagerly. After shaking hands with Royce, they sat opposite each other. Professor Myers, we've already studied the project book you gave us and are very interested in your experiment. Can you explain it to us in detail? Royce asked. Because the CEO was American, he had a particularly good attitude toward this American professor working at Stav University. Although, his proposal was written in a mess that no one could understand. Everyone said that if he couldn't even write a project book, there must be something wrong with this professor. However, Royce felt that if he visited him in person, this professor might be able to explain it more clearly. He did not mind giving this professor a chance. Wayne did not understand this. He had always been a research type player. He was not good at making proposals and he was not good at twisting and turning these things around. Otherwise, with his connections, he would not have kept the company Yvette stayed in so small. Wayne did not know that his performance was not up to standard. He was even worse at talking about the main points in front of these people. He displayed his long-winded nature. Mr. Royce, it's really good that you came. I can tell you that my project is definitely the best. You would have no worries about investing at all. Royce, this professor was clearly not suitable for business. The corners of his mouth twitched. He looked at the people behind and finally said, Professor Myers, may I ask where your assistants are? He wanted to find a person who could speak concisely and get straight to the point. However, when Wayne heard this, he choked. His laboratory was empty. He smiled awkwardly and explained, so far, I'm the only one in the laboratory. At this point, he suddenly realized that there was another person. He paused and thought about her name hard before saying, with Lisa. Yes, there's also Lisa. Um, wait a minute. I'll call her counselor and get her to come over immediately to meet you. 
Say, this Lisa is really, how can she be late at such an important time? As Wayne spoke, he took out his phone and called the counselor. Chapter 837 to 7 Investment Project Wayne took his phone and went out to make a call. He was afraid that Royce would leave. When he went out, he even turned back to look at him. After he went out, someone asked, Mr. Royce, we don't think highly of this project, in the first place. Besides, look at this professor. He's not competent either, when you asked about the members of the laboratory, he said that there were only two of them, are we really going to invest in such an experiment? Royce sighed gently too, he actually knew Wayne, it was very unusual for him to be famous as an American professor in a place like Stav. Therefore, when he saw his project, he thought that as long as it was even a little viable to invest, he would try. Anyway, the boss had too much money to spend. He would treat it as patriotism and help his fellow countrymen. However, he did not expect Wayne to be so unreliable. From the looks of it, he had only recruited one student. How was he going to do the project? Investing in him was no different than throwing away money, right? Royce touched his forehead. Forget it. He would not invest in this project. Nora followed Royce over and wanted to see what he was here for. As soon as she entered the building, before she could go upstairs and enter the elevator, she received a call from the counselor. Nora picked up the call and the counselor said, Lisa, I forgot to tell you when we met earlier, um, I got you a spot in my laboratory as an assistant. How about this? Your mentor needs you to come over right now. Hum, can you come to room 706 in the laboratory first? Laboratory assistant. This was really happening. She was just thinking about how to join a laboratory so that she could get access to the archive room. She said, okay, I'll come over now. After Nora finished speaking, she looked up and realized that this was the laboratory building. 706 was the seventh floor. She pressed the elevator button. The elevator reached the first floor quickly. She went up and pressed the button for the seventh floor. Ding. The elevator arrived. Nora had just walked out of the elevator when she heard two people talking in the corner. Wayne was pulling Wilson back angrily. He was very anxious as he said, Old boy, you definitely have bad intentions for coming here. How can I believe you? Let me tell you, don't think of entering my laboratory. I'll never let you in. Wilson sneered. I don't understand what you're talking about. I can tell you that I've been good friends with NTT's Mr. Royce for many years. I just don't want him to get cheated. You can cheat others but you can't cheat him. Wayne was even more anxious now. He had finally returned to continue his research. He could finally stop being a manager. However, because of the 20 years of absence, the school and the students no longer trusted him. Social change was fast and the school had developed a lot. When Wayne was mentioned, the new generation of investors would ask in confusion, who is this? No one would remember that more than 20 years ago, he was influential and successful at Stav University. They would only remember that he was a business loser. He had gone out to start a business and failed. Therefore, although Wayne had been back for a month, the situation here had not been resolved. His old friend saw that he was pitiful and recommended him to NTT. He even especially emphasized that he was an American professor, which was why he had received this opportunity. Wayne definitely could not give up. If he had no money, then he would have no project. If he had no project, why did he come back? He pulled Wilson back. Aren't you just jealous that I'm getting involved with Royce? Wilson, don't pretend to be so kind here. Let me tell you, it's impossible for you to see Wilson speak ill of me. Even if I have to stay out here all day, would I let you in? Get lost. Wilson felt that Wayne was simply unreasonable. He was indeed here to convince Royce not to invest in Wayne. Firstly, he did not want Wayne's project to be established. What if Wayne succeeded and suppressed him? Secondly, he planned to tell Royce how unreliable this person was an ONTT a favor. He had a good relationship with NTT the past few years. They had invested in a lot of projects. However, Wilson never expected Wayne to be so shameless. When he saw him coming over, he pulled him into the corridor. Wilson was furious and said, Wayne, you're too much. You and Lisa are the only ones in your laboratory. 
What kind of project is this? Aren't you scamming the investors? Why do you care? Only with money will we have everything we need. Without anyone to invest in the project, how can we get good students? Wayne retorted. For example, Wilson was a popular professor. Whenever a project was established, many graduate students would immediately register. With people, investors would also come. However, Wayne was different. Although everyone thought highly of his projects, no one invested in them. The students were not stupid. He had just arrived this year and did not even have a graduate student under him. How could anyone follow him? Only when they saw the investment would their classmates choose to follow him. But why would they invest in a project without enough members? This was a vicious cycle. Wilson laughed angrily. It's because the field you want to study is wrong. If it really has a future, why didn't anyone come? If they don't see any benefits in the short term, no one will follow you. Even if NTT invests in you, it will be a waste of money. I won't allow this to happen. With that, he pushed Wayne away and walked out. Wayne continued to hold him back. Don't even think about it. Wilson was really speechless and anxious. He simply said, it's fine if I don't go but if you don't return to the room for a long time, Royce and the others will leave. Isn't it the same thing? Wayne was anxious. He turned around and suddenly saw a student standing outside the staircase. As he was holding Wilson, he could not turn around and could only shout, is that Lisa outside? Nora, yes. Wayne immediately shouted, go in first and stall for time. Chapter 838 Meeting Old Friends Nora only said the word yes. Wayne did not hear her voice. Nora held her forehead. She did not expect to meet Wayne. This was really fate. She did not expect Wayne, who had returned to Stav University, to be in such a sorry state. When Wilson heard this, he was stunned. After a moment, he did not know whether to laugh or cry. Wayne, you're simply too shameless. Lisa is only an undergraduate. What can she help you with? She doesn't even know what project you're doing. You're making things difficult for her. Wayne blocked the door and refused to let Wilson out. He said, she's a student from my laboratory. Why do you care how I treat my students? Hey, Lisa, did you hear me? However, Wilson suddenly said, I regret it. Lisa, you can come to my laboratory. I'll take you in. How about that? Wayne immediately cursed, shameless Wilson, didn't you throw her to me because you thought her results were bad? You're really unscrupulous. You even want students with poor grades. When Wilson heard Wayne say this, he blushed. He knew that the counselor had definitely not told Wayne that Lisa had scored full marks for the exam. He said calmly, no, Lisa is an excellent student. I'll definitely want her. Lisa, how about it? Wayne could not turn back. He had his back pressed tightly against the door. His head was twisted so much that he could only see an indistinguishable figure in the distance. He could not see the details at all. He shouted, Lisa, don't listen to his nonsense. We're all Americans. Our eyes are filled with tears when we meet. You can't betray me. Nora. Her almond-shaped eyes narrowed slightly as she heard their conversation. It seemed like Professor Wilson thought that her results were bad, so he had pushed her to Wayne. She smiled and replied calmly, oh. Wayne instantly became smug. Did you hear that? I didn't despise her even when her results were bad. We Americans all have grateful hearts. Wilson, why don't you remember the time I helped you back then? Why do you have to come and ruin my show today? When Wilson heard Lisa say this, he shrugged. I'm not helping the investors, I'm helping you. Otherwise, if you cheat them and your reputation spreads, no one will invest in you when you start a new project. I can actually give you a few of my projects. You can start them first. It's better to look for investors after you have a reputation. Wayne sneered. How many do you want to give me? How generous of you to say that. Don't forget that I was better than you back then. My reputation was greater than yours. Wilson smiled. Is that so? But you also said that it was back then. In today's Stav University, who still remembers that there was a Professor Wayne in the biomedical faculty? You've been doing business for so many years, you've long ruined your reputation. Wayne's eyes turned red when he heard this. He was doing this to fulfill the promise he had made back then. 
That woman had died so tragically, how could he leave her alone? He shook his head and abandoned the thoughts in his mind. Anyway, I don't care. I have to take down this investor. Wilson, I won't let you meet them. He shouted again, Lisa, hurry up and go into the laboratory to talk to them. There's my business plan on the table. Take a look and read it for them, say good things, if they don't invest all of it, investing a part of it would be good enough. As Wayne was explaining, Wilson smiled. Hey, Royce is a professional investor. Do you think he can't tell anything from this? Wilson reached out his hands. All right, Wayne, I'm not going, but do you think Lisa will be of any use to you if she goes into the laboratory? You have no choice because Lisa is just an exchange student. She has no weight in this project. Wayne naturally understood this. However, in order to not let Wilson go out and cause trouble, he had to detain him here. Currently, there were only him and Lisa on the entire project. If he did not let Lisa go, what else could he do? Wayne frowned in anger. He turned around and shouted again, Lisa, hurry up. Don't let the investors wait too long. All right. After Nora agreed, she took two steps forward and walked to Laboratory 706 from the door that was revealed. Wilson looked at Wayne and shook his head. He spread his hands and pretended to look down on her. He pursed his lips and said, Wayne, I'm waiting to see a good show. Nora stood at the entrance of the laboratory. She knew that the person in the room was Royce but when she thought of Wayne's current state, she felt that she had to help him. After all, Wayne had fallen to such a state for Yvette. Sigh. She sighed and pushed open the door. Inside the room. The investor was looking at the door impatiently. Someone said, Hey, Professor Wilson sent me a message. He said that Professor Meyer's laboratory only has him and an undergraduate American exchange student. He doesn't have anyone important. How can he have the cheek to work on a project? The other person frowned and said, just two people. Furthermore, the plan is written in a mess. I can tell at a glance that it was rushed. Don't tell me Professor Maya did this alone. Ah, no wonder Professor Maya hasn't called us over despite being away for so long. He's really rude to leave us here. We shouldn't invest in such a project, right? Wilson just sent a message to suggest that we should invest very carefully. He's our partner and won't lie to us. Since he warned us, he must not be optimistic about this project. Royce took the project book and flipped through it casually before nodding. He looked down at the time and stood up. I still have something on later. Since Professor Maya is so busy, let's go. Then about the project, we'll talk about it next time. With that, he opened the door and saw a tall American girl. Chapter 839 Investment Looking at this familiar figure, Royce was stunned. He stared at Nora in disbelief, his eyes widened. Ms. Nora, was it Ms. Nora? Compared to half a year ago, when she was in New York, she seemed to have lost some weight and had become more beautiful. If not for those familiar lazy almond-shaped eyes when Nora walked on the streets, Royce would not have recognized her. But what was Ms. Nora doing here? Royce was a little stunned. As he stood there, the people behind him thought that Nora had blocked the way. Someone immediately asked, You are. Nora glanced at Liam and yawned. She said lazily, Lisa. Lisa. Royce frowned. But this was clearly Ms. Nora. Why was she calling herself Lisa? He looked at Nora in confusion, but he saw the woman giving him a cold warning gaze. Royce. He did not quite understand what this gaze meant. Royce respected Nora a lot. The chairman was not married and did not have children. When he picked Nora up from the countryside back then, he had said that NTT would be handed over to Cherry in the future. Who was Cherry? She was this woman's daughter. Moreover, wasn't he handing it to Cherry because Ms. Nora only slept all day and did not want to get involved in the business at all? The chairman had no choice. He had just said that he would hand the company to Cherry but he was actually giving it to her, in disguise. As he was thinking about Ms. Nora's intentions, the people behind him misunderstood. One of them said, you're Lisa, the person Professor Maya was talking about. Why are you here? Where's Professor Maya? Nora looked at the stairs. He, might be a little busy. Everyone, everyone felt like they had been played. W.N. They had come to see his project as investors but he was acting like such a big shot. 
Did he really think he was some well-known professor? They would still give some face to a professor like Wilson. After all, Wilson had done many projects in the past. However, Wayne was really too unpopular. Royce's first subordinate said, Since Professor Maya is so insincere, we'll get going now. We don't want to waste our time here. Nora. She raised her eyebrows and was about to speak when a bright and careful voice was heard. Well, since Lisa is here, why don't we listen to her for a minute? Following the voice, Nora then saw that her neighbor, Liam, was in this team too. Quote, comma, quote. Nora held her forehead. There were quite a few familiar faces today. However, Liam seemed to have received a promotion. It seemed like she had made him level up. After Liam finished speaking, everyone looked at Liam. Royce's subordinate scolded, you're just a newcomer to the department. What are you talking about? How can an undergraduate explain a laboratory project? It's too much. Liam was reprimanded and was too afraid to speak. On the other hand, Royce came back to his senses when Liam was interrupted by the two of them. He stared at Nora and asked, let the undergraduate talk about, Erm, do you want to talk about it? He looked at Nora tentatively. Nora, I don't know what the project is. She would not come to work on a real project. As Auntie, she had not done many projects in the past. Furthermore, it took a lot of time to work on a project. At most, she would just be registering. When Royce heard this, he immediately understood and said, then you don't have to say anything else. When he said this, one of Royce's men misunderstood him. Yes, there's no need to say anything else. It's useless even if you do. We won't be investing in your project. The project proposal is a mess. There's only the two of you, Royce. He really wanted to shut his subordinate's mouth. He was usually very good at flattering him. Why couldn't he tell that something was amiss today? He had finally come back to his senses. Ms. Nora was hiding her identity by saying that she was Lisa. The warning gaze she had given to him earlier was also to tell him not to speak nonsense. Otherwise, why would she be here if she could just expose her identity? Royce understood. Ms. Nora was asking for an investment. However, she could not expose her identity, so he had to make his investment look fair on the surface. But his own subordinate had been undermining him here. How could he still invest, fairly? As he was thinking about what to do, Liam said again, Um, actually, there are only two people involved in the project. This kind of thing is easy to resolve. Professor Maya was very famous in the school back then but he has fallen from grace these past few years. As long as we invest, the number of people would definitely not be a problem. One of Liam's men sneered and retorted, not a problem. I think it's a big problem. Have you been bribed by him? What's the difference between this and a scam? Besides, this project proposal is a complete mess. Is there any need to invest? Liam was lectured. He clenched his jaw and looked at Nora again. Renee had said that it was not easy for Nora to raise the three children alone. It was not easy for her to attend school here. They were all neighbors and he had to help. Therefore, Liam took a deep breath and continued, that project. Actually, if you look at it carefully, you can tell that it will be very valuable in the future. Although we won't be able to get any benefits in the short term, we have to look further ahead. Even if Royce was helping Wayne out of friendship, he could not have given him money for no reason. Wayne's project was indeed promising for the future. However, Royce's subordinate continued to scold him, this idea of yours is very dangerous. We're investors, of course we look at the long-term benefits. But you're a newcomer, what do you know? You still dare to speak nonsense here. Don't tell me you want to speak up for Lisa because she's beautiful. Mr. Royce will definitely not agree. Isn't that so, Mr. Royce? Chapter 840 You're welcome. Royce had been walking at the front just now, so his back was to the people behind him at the moment. As a result, his subordinates couldn't see his expression all this time. Liam was just a newcomer in the department. After being lectured, he immediately lowered his head. He indeed had selfish motives when he spoke up for Nora, so he didn't dare to refute the other men. Inwardly, though, he thought to himself, I'm done for. I've offended Mr. Royce's favorite subordinate. I probably won't have an easy time in the company now. 
The promotion he had just received might even be taken away soon. Despite that, though, he still said, you misunderstand. Lisa's just someone I know, that's all. She is not an unreliable person, she. The man beside Royce was still scolding him. You don't look at such external factors in a project, but at the project itself. So, Liam, you know Lisa. Then this means you're blind. To think you can't make a distinction between work and private matters. In my opinion, you are not suitable for our department at all. Liam, as expected, was he really going to be fired? He wanted to cry. He had only managed to dodge the bullet because of the investigation into Fred. Was he going to face another unemployment crisis now? While Liam was thinking about this dejectedly, Royce finally turned his head slowly and looked behind him. He stared at his trusted subordinate, his face totally sullen. Seeing his sullen expression, Royce's subordinate misunderstood even further. He immediately said, Mr. Royce, don't be angry. I will make sure to keep an eye on newcomers like him in the future. I. Before he could finish, Royce slammed his briefcase against his head and said, Newcomer. The way I see it, the newcomer has more gumption than you do. As soon as he said that, with the exception of Nora, a ton of question marks suddenly appeared above everyone's heads. Liam's head also whipped up and he looked at Royce in disbelief. Royce snapped, you must have gotten old, so your eye for things can't keep up with the youngsters anymore. That newcomer is doing very well in my opinion. Hum, yeah, I also think this project is promising. I'm going to invest in this. Royce's subordinate was stunned. Actually, he didn't do anything wrong. After all, Wayne's project was indeed too unreliable. It was a good project but Wayne's project proposal was simply too badly written. No one who received the proposal would invest in it. Nevertheless, the man was quick to back down. Yes, yes, you were right, Mr. Royce. In that case, how much should we invest? How much I should invest? Royce looked at Nora again while thinking to himself, Ms. Nora, can you please give me some kind of response? But Nora didn't look at him. Unable to receive any signals from her, Royce could only look at Liam. How much do you think we should invest? Liam had said just now that he and Ms. Nora knew each other, so maybe he would be able to suggest a suitable amount. Not expecting Royce to actually ask him for his opinion, Liam was a little taken aback. He said in a daze, 8, 8. Before he finished speaking, Royce nodded directly, 8 million dollars. Okay, I'll invest that amount. The money will be transferred into the account to Moore, no, tonight. Is that okay? Liam, what he'd wanted to say was, they could try investing $800,000 first. Seeing that the money was secured, Nora nodded and moved aside. Okay, what is the bank account number? Royce asked. Nora yawned again she had gotten sleepy. She pointed to the corridor and said, you can talk to W, Professor Myers about it. She turned and walked out. I'll get going then. Everyone. Royce's subordinate felt that she had snubbed his boss, so he immediately pointed at her and said, what's the matter with you? You're just an undergraduate. You. You what? Royce pressed his arm, which was rudely outstretched, down and said, shut up. You also know that she's an undergraduate, right? Undergraduates are just assistants in projects, so of course she wouldn't know anything. Go and get Wayne Myers here instead. Then, he looked at Liam with a big smile and said, You did great today, Liam. Well, come here, let's have a chat, how do you and Lisa know each other? You guys rented houses from the same landlord. Where do you live? Liam, who felt highly flattered and as though something awesome had fallen into his lap. When Nora was leaving, she specially glanced at the corridor. In the corridor, Wayne was still reasoning with Wilson. With a door between them and Nora, the volume of his voice was reduced several times. He droned on and on. Wilson, you are not loyal to your friends at all, I know you want to suppress me so that I won't be able to catch up with you. God damn it, in any case, you can forget about leaving this place today. If I can't get NTT to invest in my project, then I will starve to death here with you. Wilson was practically speechless. You are so shameless. Wayne completely ignored his outburst and continued to nag at him. Nora, she knocked on the door and said, W, Professor Myers, I'm Lisa. 
Wayne immediately cried out, Lisa, have they made their decision? I knew it, NTT is not going to invest in us, sigh. I. Before he could finish, though, Norris' low voice came over. NTT is asking whether an investment of $8 million is enough. What? He suspected that he had misheard. It was not until Nora repeated herself that he suddenly let go of Wilson. The man, who had still been dejected a moment ago, was suddenly revitalized. Yes, it's enough. It's enough. When he turned around and looked over, Nora had already strode ahead of her. When Wayne opened the door and entered the corridor from the stairwell, all he saw was Lisa's back. He wanted to say something but he suddenly heard footsteps coming from the other side. The people from NTT came up to him and said respectfully, Professor Myers, let's sign the contract. Wayne turned around instantly and went off with the people from NTT, leaving behind only an utterly confused Wilson. He widened his eyes, finding the turn of events absolutely incredible. Had the world gone crazy? NTT was investing $8 million in Wayne. Good God, was NTT doing charity because they had too much money or what? The extent of Wilson's shock was exactly how triumphant Wayne felt. He mocked him extensively for a while, pissing Wilson off so much that even his heart rate was out of whack. Nora didn't know of all of this and neither did she care. She strolled around the school again. Soon, it was evening. Nora decided to go home, she mustn't leave the three children at home all by themselves for too long. As soon as she got home, she coincidentally saw that Liam was also at his door. Nora raised her eyebrows. Before she could speak, Liam looked up, smiled at her, and said confidently, You're welcome. We're neighbors, so it's only right that I give you a hand. It's just that I never thought that our company leader would think so highly of me. And even listen to my suggestion, Nora. Quote question mark quote. The corners of her lips spasmed and she uttered an, oh, a little speechlessly. Liam smiled. It's not easy for you to take care of three children by yourself, so I will definitely help you if you run into trouble. Now that you've clinched the investment deal, your professor will definitely value you. Your education journey will also become very smooth sailing. You really don't have to thank me. But if you really want to, then you can do me a favor. Nora kept quiet for a while before she asked, what kind of favor? Can you guys keep Renee company a little? I'm always busy with work, so she's all alone at home. Plus, with her personality, just take care of her a little. You can just think of it as thanking me for helping you out today. Liam practically felt like he was a messiah. To be honest, he just impulsively blurted it out when he spoke up for Nora earlier. At that time, he had also been terrified and had really thought he was going to be fired. Unexpectedly, his company leader had spotted his talent. As expected, he really was a talent when it came to making investments. Liam looked at Nora again. Yeah, it really wasn't easy for Lisa to take care of her children all by herself. He should help wherever he could. The thought had only just formed in his mind when the sound of a car stopping outside the villa suddenly reached them. Liam looked behind to see Royce getting out of his Rolls Royce limousine. Then, he hurried through the gates. Liam was surprised. Then, joy came over his face and he strode over. Mr. Royce, why are you here? Had Royce come to visit and look at his living conditions since he had asked earlier in the day where he lived? Didn't the leaders of NTT value him a little too much? Unexpectedly. Chapter 841 Strange Text Messages Liam thought that Royce was here to visit him, so he even felt faintly like something fantastic had just fallen into his lap but he never expected Royce to simply walk past him and stride right up to Nora. Liam was stunned. When he turned around, he saw the man, who was high up in the air in the company, ask, Ms. N, Ms. Lisa, why are you here? Does ma'am know? Liam, the handsome and cheerful boy was utterly stunned. He stared at Royce in disbelief. What did he just say? He swallowed. Ms. Lisa. Ma'am. Why was he speaking so politely as though her position was above his? The only person whom Royce would address as, ma'am, was the boss of NTT. Why was he asking Lisa about her? Liam's thoughts were in a mess. He couldn't figure out what was going on at all. He stared blankly at Royce and then at Nora. 
For a while, he felt like he was dreaming. Nora sighed a little the moment she saw Royce. It seemed that she wouldn't be able to conceal this identity of hers in front of Liam anymore. She broke into a small frown. She first nodded slightly at Royce, motioning to him to wait a moment. Then, she looked at Liam and said, please keep my identity a secret. Liam nodded dumbly. Then, Nora looked at him again and asked, so, can you let me have a private word with Royce? Liam, he looked at Royce. When Liam first joined the company, he had seen Royce high up in the air. He was surrounded by people when he walked past Liam. He hadn't even spared him a glance. At that time, Liam had told himself that he must work hard to climb the ladder into the department and become Royce's subordinate. And become someone like Royce. But the goal he was struggling in life to move towards was instead standing humbly in front of Lisa with a respectful look on his face. In fact, the man, who had never even spared him a glance before, was even giving him a somewhat ingratiating smile right now. Liam knew that this was all because of Lisa. In his trance, he nodded and walked into his house. After closing the door, he couldn't hear what Lisa and Royce were saying anymore. However, at this distance, he could still see Lisa saying something to Royce in a low voice and Royce nodding repeatedly. This huge reversal of roles made Liam hang his head in disappointment. He was an honest man, so he wanted to climb higher grounds with his own efforts. Even when Fred was bullying him the other time, he hadn't felt anything and had just thought that this was something that a man should do. But at this moment, seeing Lisa's sudden transformation from someone who needed his help to someone high up in the air, he couldn't help but sigh. In this world, a person's social status was simply too predisposed to change. Dash. Don't tell my aunt. Nora ordered, her voice extremely frosty. Royce gave her a wry smile. Ms. Nora, this, if ma'am finds out, I'm afraid I will be punished. Nora said, it's fine. I'll get Cherry to bail you out when that happens. Okay, then it's all a-okay. With Ms. Cherry around, there absolutely won't be any problems with ma'am. What are you doing here though, Ms. Nora? Royce had come especially for Nora's promise. One was his boss while the other was the future successor. He didn't want to offend either. But if he informed his boss straight away, Nora would definitely get angry, so it was imperative that he came to ask for instructions and also get a guarantee from her. Royce was very shrewd. Cherry's significance to his boss was incomparable to everyone else. At this question, Nora said, you don't need to bother with my affairs. Just make sure you do your job well and that would do. Royce immediately lowered his head slightly in deference. Okay. Then, he gave Nora his promise and said, I will definitely handle Professor Meyer's project well, I won't let anyone block his funds. And Liam, too. I will also promote him when the time comes. Ms. Nora, are you planning to set up your own team in the company? The successor would surely need a new team, so Royce had misunderstood. Upon hearing this, Nora glanced to the side. Liam was standing in front of the window and staring at her with a complicated expression. However, the scorching idolizing look in his eyes was impossible to hide. That was what a young man who had just graduated from school should look like, full of hope for his career, enveloped in passion, and dying to break out into the world. Nora thought of how Liam stayed by Renee's side and had never abandoned her. She also thought of how she had specially done a background check on Liam because she was worried that he had brainwashed Renee and was emotionally manipulating her but found that he had a clean family background. From kindergarten all the way to university, there were photos from every stage of his life. There was no way anyone could fake that. Therefore, after a moment's thought, Nora replied ambiguously, you can try putting a little more effort into grooming him. Liam was kind-hearted and a good person. He had even dared to speak up for her at the university. From that, one could see that the young man did have the passion to make achievements. People like him were capable, so it would also be beneficial for NTT to train and groom him. Royce nodded right away. No problem. After the two reached an agreement, Nora instructed Royce not to disturb her if there was nothing important. Only then did Royce leave subserviently. After Royce left, when Nora was about to enter her house, Liam suddenly opened his door and walked out. He looked at her blankly as he said, L. Lisa, um, 
He wanted to say something but he didn't know how to put it into words. In the end, he simply said, about the incident with Fred the other time, thanks. He had finally understood. It wasn't because of his luck that something had happened to Fred, rather, it was Nora who had given the company a heads up. Nora looked at him. Suddenly, her lips curled into a smile and she replied, you're welcome. You can just let Renee keep my children company a little more. Liam. He thought back to what he'd said just now about how she didn't need to thank him and that it would do if they just spent a little more time with Renee. Liam's face suddenly started to burn. He scratched his head and smiled at her naively. The naive young man couldn't help but always think that he was the hero of the world and that it was his good fortune to be appreciated by his boss. It was only now that he realized that his real luck was getting to know Nora. After Royce left, he got into the car. Just as he was about to leave, he noticed Fred approaching. Mrs. Long was still living here for the time being. Her son had not only suddenly lost his job but he couldn't even find a job in the industry anymore. She had no place to go for the time being. Thus, Cindy, the landlord, had given her a few more days to find new accommodation before she moved out. Nora didn't have much to say about this. After all, Mrs. Long was busy looking for a job, so she didn't have the time to bully Cherry anymore. It wasn't like Nora would only be satisfied after she drove them into a dead corner. Fred's job search had also been very difficult. At NTT, he was already a senior executive, so now that he was restarting as a low employee, not many companies were willing to hire him. Even if there were some that were willing, they offered a very low salary. He wanted to go back to NTT but he was told that he had offended someone. Who on earth had he offended? He only punished Liam recently but he had already investigated the young man's family background a long time ago. There was no way he would have such connections. When he came back all down and dejected, he suddenly caught a glimpse of Royce's car, which instantly stunned him on the spot. It was Royce. He was a company leader who stood above all but one. Why was he here? Could it be that? Fred swallowed and entered the garden. When he did, he happened to see that Nora hadn't gone into her house yet. During the last two days after he returned home, his mother had pointed at Nora's door and complained to him. She said that the woman, who just moved in, had bullied her. She had told him a lot, such as how she was taking care of three children even though she was all by herself. Fred had been busy looking for a job, so he hadn't had time to give them trouble yet. He was just so planning to make trouble for them today. But when he thought of Royce's car, the stunned man blurted, Was Royce here for you? Nora. She raised her brows. It didn't matter that Liam had found out about her identity because he would keep the secret for her, but Fred and Mrs. Long were not good people. If they found out, Nora wouldn't be able to keep her identity a secret anymore. But Royce had just left and she was out in the garden. Nora glanced to the side. When she saw Liam, she pointed at him calmly and replied, he was here for him. Liam. Fred was already looking at him. Faced with his former supervisor's gaze, Liam swallowed. After a while, he nodded and pretended to say calmly, yes, he was here for me. Fred was utterly stunned. He suddenly thought of how he had been fired just when he was going to punish Liam. He was even told that he had offended someone he shouldn't have. Wouldn't that precisely mean Liam? Thus, he reacted very quickly and rushed over. He said, Liam, no, Mr. Martin, you know what they say about how friends begin as enemies. We just got off on the wrong foot, that's all. I'm sorry for what I did to you in the past. Should I get down on my knees? Spare me. I really can't find a job now and my family will be out of food next month. I have elderly and children in my family. Liam. He looked at Nora in alarm and uncertainty. Seeing that he was staying quiet and looking at Nora, Fred also looked at her. He thought of what Mrs. Long had done and hurriedly said, Ms. Lisa, I'm sorry, my mother only bullied you because her younger sister wants to move here. She wanted to rent the house that you're living in, that's why she wanted to drive you away. I'll apologize to you, okay. Nora already knew this a long time ago, so she was unmoved. At this moment, Mrs. Long also came home. With her cell phone in hand, she ranted as she walked. 
If you're not coming, then why send me a message saying that you want to? You asked me to rent a place for you and even said that you want to live with me. I almost drove my neighbors away because of you. Now you're telling me that it wasn't you. That you didn't send me any messages. Ha, huh, how can that be? My chat messages are all right here. Fred was dumbfounded. He looked at Mrs. Long and asked, Mom, did she say she isn't coming anymore? Mrs. Long was furious. Yeah, I thought she was coming today, so I called and asked where she was, but now she says that she never sent me any messages asking me to rent a house for her. Has she become muddle-headed from old age? Mom, how can you get something like this wrong? Fred was aghast. In order to rent that house, he defended someone he shouldn't have and even lost his job. No, Fred, I didn't make a mistake. It's your aunt who's being inexplicable. I'm serious, look. The chat messages are all here. Mrs. Long hurriedly took out her cell phone and handed it to Fred. Just as Fred was about to look at it, a slender hand suddenly reached over. Nora stared at the chat messages on Mrs. Long's phone. Two days before she arrived, Mrs. Long had received a message on her cell phone asking her to help with renting a house. After that, the person chatted with her every day and pressed her about the house. But Nora could tell at a glance that the tone of these chat messages was different from that of the previous messages. Her phone had been hacked. Nora's eyes narrowed. She had never been one to think that such things were mere coincidences. Someone must be up to no good behind the scenes. But who was it? She took Mrs. Long's cell phone and went into her own house. Mrs. Long shouted anxiously, Hey, what's the matter with you? Are you stealing my phone? But before she could go on, Fred stopped her. After Nora entered the house, she took out her own cell phone and easily hacked into Mrs. Long's. Then, through the text messages, she began to track down the other party. She wanted to know who was plotting against them, and what their objective was. Chapter 842 Don't Laugh It stood to reason that, for the other party to use Mrs. Long's sister's number to send her messages for so long without her sister ever finding out, meant that they must have hacked into Mrs. Long's sister's cell phone and used it to send the messages. With that in mind, Nora also went with the flow and hacked into Mrs. Long's sister's cell phone. There would always be traces left behind whenever a cell phone was hacked into. She sat on the sofa, her cat-like eyes skimming through the programming codes at high speed. Suddenly, she found something and followed it, planning to find out who that person was. Unexpectedly, though, the person who had still been online a moment ago suddenly vanished. The device on the other end was also destroyed. With this, Nora could no longer find out anything about the other party. She broke into a frown. This showed that the other party was undoubtedly a master hacker. The moment she invaded, they discovered her. Additionally, they could also get out in time when she wanted to pinpoint their location. This indicated that they were even more skilled at hacking than her. In this world, other than herself, why was the only other hacker on the same level as her? But why was Justin, so it couldn't be him? If he didn't want her to come to Switzerland, a phone call would have done the trick. There was no need for him to stoop to such low-level means. In that case, if it was not why, then who was it? When did another top hacker emerge? When Nora thought of this, something suddenly occurred to her. She picked up her cell phone and called Caleb, who answered in a timely manner. Is something wrong? He asked. Nora asked, among the five children who survived the experiments back then, did any of them pick up hacking? Caleb paused for a moment when he heard this. Then, he answered, yes. Nora's heart sank. Caleb sighed. Now that you're going to meet them sooner or later, I'll tell you about the five of us. Nora's expression became grave and solemn. Go on. Caleb said, you've already met, Barbarian, he's the man in black who attacked you and Justin in America. He was injected with a gene serum that enhances physical fitness, so he's likely the strongest martial artist in the world at present. He has a pair of brown pupils. Wait, Nora interrupted him, I saw blue pupils that night. Caleb chuckled. Cosmetic contact lens technology is so advanced these days, isn't it a piece of cake to change the color? Nora was practically speechless. They could even do something like that. She had been planning to identify him by his eyes. 
Caleb continued, that guy's skills have probably already reached the pinnacle of what humanity can achieve. No one can beat him in a fight. Nora acknowledged that. That night, she and Justin were no match for him even when they teamed up. Quinn and Irvin hers and Justin's teachers, were probably the only ones who were his match. His weakness is that he's stupid. Of course, his IQ is that of an ordinary human, but because his offensive abilities are simply too powerful and his body too nimble and agile, we couldn't kill him all these years, either. Were you guys trying to kill him? Caleb coughed and replied, like me, he resents the mysterious organization for using us in human experiments, so he has long since defected. Truman has organized many capture and assassination attempts but none of them have been successful. Caleb also resented the mysterious organization. That was why he had betrayed the mysterious organization and become the special department spy after he contracted lung cancer and had only two months left to live. Barbarian's offensive abilities were very good. Nora mentally positioned him. She then asked, who else is there? Caleb went on, there's also one whom we call, Spacey, because he likes to space out. He was very unsociable when he was a child, he was injected with the gene serum that improves neural genes, so he is extremely smart. I heard that when he grew up, he started dismantling computers and found that he liked it a lot. Nora caught a key word. Heard. Caleb smiled wryly and said, yeah, well, the five of us had already separated from one another when we were ten years old. Back then, the mysterious organization told me to stay with Truman while they sent the other three to other places. At that time, I didn't understand why, but I later realized it was because they knew a long time ago about the deal that the Greys had struck with your mother, so they were using me as bait. Truman treats me very well though, maybe because we once shared weal and woe. Nora nodded. Go on. Caleb continued. There is also one whom we call, listener. You should know that the human ear can only detect sounds of a certain frequency, so we cannot hear sounds below or above that range. But after this part of the human DNA was deciphered, he could hear sounds of every frequency in the world. He is also highly sensitive to sound, so he has always disliked us for being too loud. Barbarians' improved genes were related to physical qualities, which was understandable. Spacey's were neural genes. She reckoned that like her, some improvement was also made to his IQ genes, so he was smarter than ordinary people. But wasn't listener's story, a little silly? The corners of her lips spasmed. Isn't a skill like that kinda useless? Caleb coughed. Humans research DNA and decipher the DNA code in order to enhance our abilities. In terms of nimbleness and agility, we can't compare to leopards, in lifespan, we can't compare to turtles. Therefore, the DNA research back then was tackled from various aspects. It was just that everyone's injections were random. Nora nodded. She suddenly became very curious. What kind of gene serum were you injected with back then? As soon as she asked, Caleb fell silent. A while later, he let out a low laugh. He sighed and slowly asked, can I keep it a secret? Of course, no one should be forced into such things. Just as Nora was about to say that, Caleb sighed and said, forget it, I'll tell you. But, you mustn't laugh. Nora, she mustn't laugh. Could it be that Caleb's improved genes were even more useless than listeners? Chapter 843 What a coincidence. While Nora was wondering about it curiously, Caleb coughed and said, forget it, I won't say it anymore. Quote comma quote. The corners of Nora's lips spasmed a little and she suspected that Caleb was playing her for a fool. Seemingly sensing her displeasure, Caleb chuckled lowly and said, I really can't bring myself to say it. If I ever see you again in this lifetime, I will tell you in person. Caleb had returned to the mysterious organization this time as the special department spy. He only had two months left to live. In fact, if his lung cancer worsened, he might not even have two months. Therefore, he didn't know when he would be able to return to America and see Nora again. Nora realized what he meant, so she said, we will meet for sure. Hopefully. Caleb was about to speak again when a shrill voice suddenly came from the far end of the phone. Who are you calling, hiding here? It was Truman. Nora frowned, worried about Caleb. No one in particular. Caleb's voice was calm and he didn't seem to be nervous at all. 
Oh, hey, show me. The sound of people fighting over the phone came from the other side. Caleb said anxiously, give me back the phone. Truman scoffed. Am I not allowed to know who you're on the phone with? I'm going to see what you're doing behind my back. After that, Truman must have looked at the phone and seen her name, because he sneered and said, my little servant. 2. 11. Nora ignored him but Truman said with a sneer, oh my, I didn't expect you two to keep in contact even after you've separated. Why, is my little servant interested in my little sidekick? Or, his voice suddenly turned frosty, has my little sidekick betrayed me? And turned to you guys. Nora wanted to make up an excuse but before she could speak, Caleb sighed and said, she was just asking me a few personal questions. What kind of questions? Truman was pushy and aggressive. And personal ones at that. Ha, huh, are the two of you even that close? Seeing this, Nora did not speak. Caleb continued speaking in an even-tempered manner. He said, she was asking me about the five people who survived back then and what they are like. She wants to find Barbarian and avenge Justin. His story seemed to have convinced Truman. He scoffed and said, my little servant, you want to seek revenge. I'd advise you not to fantasize about that. It's impossible for you to contend with Barbarian when you only have a normal person's strength. After he spoke, he asked, did you tell her what Barbarian's genetic modification is? Caleb replied, yeah, I did. Truman uttered an, oh, and then asked, and listener and spacies. I told her, tisk. Truman smacked his lips softly and remarked, you sure tell her everything you know. Do you like her that much? Nora was a little taken aback to hear this. She looked at the phone in astonishment, upon which she heard Caleb's prompt rejection. Don't talk nonsense, she and I are just friends. Truman scoffed. Just friends. From when we were children all the way till now, I have never seen you care so much about any friend. Caleb, don't forget who you are. Do you have any right to be in love with someone? Nora slowly frowned. Caleb was in love with her. How could this be? How few times in total have they met? She was about to speak when Caleb denied it. I don't, I know very well who I am. I just feel guilty towards Miss Smith, that's all. After all, the Greys didn't manage to protect her back then. Truman scoffed again. You say one thing but mean another. You're really very dull. You are already about to die yet you still don't have the courage to express your feelings. Caleb had really panicked this time. Truman, shut up. After saying that, he hurriedly explained, Nora, don't listen to his nonsense. Nora was a little embarrassed. Okay, although she had been confessed to by many others, she really hadn't expected Caleb to fall for her. She shook her head, dismissing the idea. Then she heard Truman say, you guys are so boring. Forget it. My little servant, Barbarian's body has been improved to the greatest extent. He can not only control every muscle with finesse but he can also lift a thousand pounds. Even if you are the Quinn School of Martial Arts big sister, compared to him, you still have lots more to work on. If you really want to avenge Justin, then there is only one way. Nora lowered her eyes. What is it? Truman suddenly laughed. Training with me. Nora. Truman asked, do you know which genes of mine were improved? Nora shook her head. No. Truman laughed. It's longevity. Nora. Truman said slowly, once humans live for a long enough time, don't they all pursue longevity? The gene serum I was injected with improves precisely this gene. You and I won't be able to beat Barbarian in a fight even if we team up but we can wear him down until he dies. The joke really was not funny at all. Truman, however, suddenly said seriously, do you think I'm joking? I'm not. What do you think a person pursues after they have earned enough money? Don't kings and people with high social status eventually all pursue immortality? Barbarians boost in physical strength and species boost in intelligence are all nonsense in the face of longevity. Why do you think the mysterious organization studied human genes in the first place? It was precisely for longevity. Nora. My little servant, is the information I told you today enough? Hey, are you considering joining us now? Once we find the V-16, we will crack the code of human longevity. Nora curled her lip. I'm not interested in longevity. Tisk. Truman curled her lip and said no more to her. 
Instead, he said, Caleb, I've found news of Barbarian. Go to him and bring me back the clue to V-16, or V-16 itself. Where is he? asked Caleb. Norris' ears pricked up too. However, Truman hung up the phone at this moment. Nora, Truman had definitely brought up Barbarian's whereabouts on purpose without telling her the answer. Nora put aside thoughts of Barbarian for now and began to think about the person who had hacked into Mrs. Long's cell phone. If she wasn't wrong, he must be Spacey. But why would Spacey do that? Did he just want to use Mrs. Long to give her some painless annoyance? Was there any point in doing that? Nora couldn't figure out what Spacey was thinking, so she could only put down the phone. She was a little curious about Caleb's improved genes and why it was so difficult for him to speak of it. The next day, when Nora went to class, the counselor walked in with a bespectacled man. Guys, this is our school's newly hired professor. Please welcome him, everyone. Nora, as she looked at Caleb's familiar and gentle face as he stood on the podium, she suddenly curled her lips into a smile. Caleb did a self-introduction. Then, when his gaze swept across the students, the moment he saw Nora, he paused slightly obviously, he had no idea that Nora was here. With this though, Nora had also confirmed something. Truman had ordered Caleb to find Barbarian. Since Caleb had shown up here, this meant that Barbarian was at Stav University. Besides, now that they had met, she would also be able to know about Caleb's improved genes. Chapter 844 Auntie's reputation is unwarranted by actual skill. That professor is so handsome. The students below the podium were all secretly discussing Caleb. Nora raised her brows. Caleb was really very handsome. On top of that, the dashing aura around him was elegant and gentle. He wore glasses and always smiled gently before he spoke, which gave people a refreshing feel, like a spring breeze. Yet at the same time, it didn't give people the feeling that he was easy to get close to. On the contrary, there was a sense of alienation and nobility. He and Justin both came from wealthy families but the two gave people completely different feelings. Justin felt like a fierce and ferocious war god. He was terrifying and intimidating. Caleb, on the other hand, was like a celestial being, making people feel like he was out of one's reach. Nora lowered her eyes, put her head on the table, and fell asleep. She attended classes just so she wouldn't attract attention. She had chosen to be an exchange student at this time because there weren't many classes during this period. Caleb's voice was gentle and hypnotic. As Nora listened, she slept even more soundly. On the podium, Caleb chuckled when he saw the girl fall asleep, and he subconsciously lowered his volume. In fact, when someone spoke, he gently reminded them, keep your voice down. Don't disturb your classmates who are sleeping. The students. The class was soon over. After class, Nora stretched and stood up. This time, she didn't leave but looked at Caleb at the front instead. Caleb wanted to come to her but was stopped by a student. Professor Gray, I don't understand this part here. Nora yawned. While she was waiting for him, a voice suddenly came from the side. Hey, Lisa. She turned her head and saw Oscar standing beside her with an embarrassed look on her face. She said, I know you may not care, but I still want to apologize. Nora knew what she meant. She didn't mind, though. She didn't regard Oscar as a friend, so she didn't take her prejudice towards her to heart at all. She nodded and said, it's okay. After speaking, she picked up her bag and went out the door. Oscar had a complicated look on her face as she looked at Lisa from the back. After hearing what the counselor had said the day before, she had gone to Professor Wilson to check her exam papers. In the end, she found that the other girl had indeed gotten every question right. At first, she felt that the girl had deceived her, but she immediately realized the next moment that Lisa had never said that she couldn't do the questions. In fact, she had even mentioned several times that she didn't need her help. It was her own arrogance that had made her think that Nora's grades were bad. Oscar stared at Lisa from the back. For some reason, she suddenly felt like the girl's image in her mind was getting bigger and bigger. Nora didn't leave after she exited the classroom but stood at the corner and waited. After a while, Caleb came over. The man, who was a head taller than her, asked with a smile, Lisa. 
Nora nodded. Yeah, Lisa. Caleb smiled again. He said, long time no see. Yeah, long time no see. Nora replied calmly. Caleb looked straight at her and then asked, are you okay? Nora, just as she was puzzled over Caleb's question, she heard Caleb speak again. About Mr. Hunt. All right, Nora had once again forgotten that Justin was dead. She lowered her eyes. In order to hide her emotions, she could only say calmly, actually, we weren't that close. Strictly speaking, she and Justin had only known each other for three months and during those three months, they had not been together every day, either. When she put it that way, even she herself was puzzled. She had never had many friends her whole life, so why had she fallen in love with him in such a short period of time? On top of that, it was to the extent of complete trust. Nora's expression at the moment seemed a little puzzled. Her statement convinced Caleb, though. After all, Nora had always been cold and indifferent since she was a child and had never been one to fixate on relationships. To be honest, it would be stranger if she was dramatic about it. Seeing that she wasn't too hung up over it, a smile formed on Caleb's face and he said, Yeah, I'm glad you're all right. He looked at the time and suggested, Let's have lunch together. Sure. Caleb was the special department's undercover agent. Additionally, when he was in America, he'd helped her a lot. Besides, Nora also wanted to know about Barbarian, so she and Caleb left the school together and went to a private room in a restaurant nearby. When the food came, Nora sat opposite Caleb and asked about Barbarian first. Is Barbarian here? Caleb nodded. Truman found out that Barbarian had appeared in the school, so he wanted me to come over and take a look. Why are you here too? Right after he spoke, he figured out something and asked directly, did you come here because you have a clue about V-16? Nora knew that she wouldn't be able to give a convincing explanation once she was found here. Even a fool wouldn't believe her spiel about being an exchange student at this point. Besides, even though she couldn't fully trust Caleb, some things were still okay to let him know. She nodded. Yes. Caleb frowned. Then you have to be careful. If Spacey has his eye on you, then he must know that you are here. Barbarian is also here. Nora, you mustn't underestimate any of the five of us who survived among thousands of people. Nora nodded, her expression solemn. Got it. After speaking, she suddenly asked, So, which genes of yours were improved? Caleb instantly turned red. He was a little embarrassed. Nora smiled slightly. You said that you would tell me if we ever meet again. Caleb sighed. Forget it, I'll tell you. Okay. Nora's ears pricked up curiously. Caleb seemed a little shy. He coughed and then sighed and said, Well, it's my heat resistance genes. Nora. Her first reaction was that she didn't understand. Caleb sighed. At the appropriate level of humidity, the average person's cells start dying at around 113 degrees Fahrenheit. The highest one can endure is 122 degrees but I can survive in an environment of 176 degrees. Nora. So, what was the use of improving genes like that? Why would humans study such strange things? But the next moment, she realized a problem. Then can't you undergo high temperature treatment for your lung cancer? Cancer cells can be killed at just 110 degrees. At 110 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, cancer cells would die after a few hours. However, normal cells would also be killed at the same time, which was why humans couldn't fight cancer with this method. But Caleb could. Just as Nora was about to say something, she suddenly realized something. The cancer cells can also survive at 176 degrees. Caleb nodded. Nora, if his cancer could be cured so easily, he would have recovered a long time ago. Other doctors must have also thought of this idea before. She held her forehead. Caleb looked calm, though. It's okay, I have already prepared myself for it. In any case, even if my cancer is cured, I won't be able to find the V-16. Anyway, cancer was difficult to treat. Nora sighed silently. She then asked, what are Spacey's characteristics? Caleb shook his head. I haven't seen him since I was 10 and he didn't like to talk much back then. Apart from Spacey, you also have to watch out for listener. 
Nora, all five of us who survived, want to live, so they will definitely fight with you for the V-16. The key here is time is running out. Xander didn't have much time left, either. Nora knew that she had to hurry and find a way to enter the archives and obtain file number. 004. Since the food was here, the two of them stopped talking and started to eat. Halfway through the meal, because the chatter was simply too loud in the private room next door, faint voices traveled over. Professor Epson, the results of your research are great. You have been trying to invite Auntie to do this project with you, right? Except she didn't respond. If she learns that you have succeeded in your research for the project, she will definitely regret it. It was a student paying lip service to Epson. Of course. Epson sneered, the way I see it, Auntie's reputation is unwarranted by any actual skill. Look at how many patients she has operated on over the years. Two operations a month. I can't help but wonder if those patients were even really sick. Some students next to him also echoed him. Yeah, who knows, maybe they were just acting with her. If her medical skills are really that great, why would she do that? Chapter 845 First Time Epson sneered. You make it sound so mysterious. Her formalism is too extreme. She only treats two sick patients every month. I don't believe that she'll only treat two people a month when her husband, son, and father get sick together. Will she let the other person wait for death? How ridiculous. Ha 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 ha. The others also laughed. Epson was actually not popular with the students. He deliberately gave convoluted lectures to emphasize that he was different from the others, rendering everyone unable to understand his lectures. Even Oscar had to listen carefully. If she was even a little distracted, she would not be able to keep up. Therefore, Epson had always had a demon class in school. He was arrogant and proud. The project he applied for could not be completed by himself but he did not want anyone to take a share. Now that someone had finally invested in his project, he finally had some results and had long been promoted. If he did not know Auntie and did not have her contact details, he would have walked to Auntie long ago. What he was about to solve was a difficult problem in the medical world. It was said that Auntie had been researching this difficult problem for a few years. Until now, there had been no results. Epson now wished he could announce to the world that he was a hundred times better than Auntie. Nora originally did not care about their mockery but when she heard, husband, son, and father, she frowned. He should not badmouth her family. Shouldn't he be a little considerate when badmouthing others? She stood up and was about to go over and teach Epson a lesson when the room door was kicked open. Epson and the students exclaimed, Who are you? Which school are you from? Nora was raising her eyebrows when she heard a familiar female voice charmingly say, Tisk, listen carefully, you can learn from me. Call me, mother. Come, learn from me. Mother. Epson and the other students were at first very vigilant against this woman who had suddenly barged in, but when they heard her charming voice, they subconsciously repeated her words. Sigh, my stupid sons. The woman smiled. It was only then that Epson and the other students realized that they had been played. They were instantly furious and shouted, bitch. Epson was furious but he was a teacher, after all. Therefore, he asked, what are you doing? Do you have something against us? The woman sneered. I don't have any grudges with you but the auntie you're talking about is my sister-in-law. Of course, I can't stand you badmouthing her. Now, you better apologize to her or else. Thud. With the sound of a glass bottle shattering, Brenda said domineeringly, no one will leave here unscathed today. Dash. In the private room next door. Hearing Brenda's voice, Nora felt that it was unbelievable. Wasn't Brenda in New York? Why was she in Switzerland? She was about to leave the room and reunite with Brenda when her phone rang again. She picked it up and heard Solo's voice on the other end. Auntie, sigh. Nora. This fellow was always full of energy when he called her. Why was he sighing the moment he called? It seemed like something was wrong. Wasn't Solo in New York? She frowned. What's wrong? Do you know where your sister-in-law is? Solo's voice was listless. I suddenly can't contact her. We were fine at first but she suddenly suggested breaking up with me. Now, she's gone. Solo continued, I want to ask her in person why she left without saying goodbye. 
What did she say? She said she has always been a loose woman. She said she was only playing with me for a while but I don't believe it. Who the hell wants to play with me by giving up their first time? Nora, her first time. Brenda liked to mess around and she liked handsome men. She would flirt with any man she saw, so Nora thought that Brenda had done it a long time ago. Was it really her first time? Solo said, yes, I'm sure it was her first time, with me. Why? Chapter 846 Killed. Nora felt a little stunned. Was Brenda's flirtatious behavior all fake? She thought that Brenda was naturally dissolute, oh, wait. Justin had said that Brenda was fine when she was young, but she suddenly seemed to have become a different person when she returned home after going overseas. At that time, Justin had a lot of opinions about foreign countries. He said that Cherry would stay in the country when she grew up, that the culture overseas was too bad, and so on. While Nora was thinking, Solo continued, besides, she disappeared. I can't find her anywhere. Her information is very confidential. Isn't she just a small police officer? Are the identities of all the police officers in New York so difficult to investigate? Solo was a hacker. If he wanted to find someone, he could just search on his computer. He wanted to know where Brenda lived, where she was, and if she had gone out. However, he did not have any clues. Brenda's identity was kept secret. Nora, it's not that difficult, is it? Solo sneered. Hey, how is it not difficult? Although I'm not as good at hacking as you are in your queue, you might not be better than me when it comes to finding people. To be honest, I'm doing this for you because you saved me. Why don't you show me your skills as Q? Nora, there's no need. Solo agitated her. I think you're afraid. If you can't find her, would you feel embarrassed? If word gets out that Q can't even find a person. Nora. This provocation was useless against her. Solo said so much because he wanted to provoke her to help him find someone. The low voices of Epson and the other students rang out in the private room next door, accompanied by Brenda's cold smile. Did you just apologize? I didn't hear you. Louder. Nora, I know where she is. Solo, fuck, are you that fast? How long has it been? I've been searching for hours on the internet but I haven't found anything. Only a second has passed, right? Solo felt like his worldview had exploded. They were both computer hackers, so how could the difference be so great? The corners of Nora's mouth twitched. She ignored him and did not care about his thoughts. Instead, she said, I'll ask if she's willing to see you. Solo, how can you be like this? Am I your good friend or her? Nora, she's not my good friend. Then what's there to consider? You have to support me. Nora replied calmly, but she's my sister-in-law. After hanging up the call, Nora went out. As soon as she came out, she saw Epson and the other students in a sorry state. Their faces were all bruised. It seemed like Brenda had not been gentle. A few people walked out of the private room in a panic and looked at Brenda. Wait here, we'll call the police immediately. Brenda laughed softly and waved her fists. Epson and the students were instantly frightened. They turned around and ran. Epson even fell down during his escape. He looked very pathetic. Brenda seemed to be satisfied. She clapped her hands, and when she turned around, she suddenly saw Nora. She immediately said in surprise, Nora, why are you here? Then, she saw Caleb walking out of the private room with Nora. She asked, you're eating with a friend? Yes. Nora pointed to the private room. Join us. Brenda nodded. Her gaze brushed past Caleb's face and she asked, didn't you go to Truman's place to be a spy? Caleb had been captured by the special department before, so Brenda knew him very well. Caleb said, yes, he sent me to complete a mission. I know, Brenda said. After entering the private room with Nora, as a member of the special department, she first checked the cameras around the private room. After confirming that there were no problems, she said, you reported to Captain Ford that Barbarian was at Stav University, right? So, Captain Ford sent me here. After all, this is my territory. As an Interpol officer, Brenda had always been on duty in Switzerland. She was very familiar with the surroundings. Caleb asked, you're here to look for Barbarian? Yes, Brenda said, we investigated Barbarian. 
He's a serial killer. He'll definitely take the chance to kill when he comes to Stav University. Besides, someone has already been killed. When Brenda said this, it instantly aroused Norris' interest. Who? Brenda explained, he was a professor who researched genes at Stav University. He was found dead at home last night. The method of murder was very cruel. We investigated the scene and suspect that it was done by Barbarian. He should be looking for clues about V-16. Nora instantly frowned. When Barbarian was in the country, he would hide his murderous intentions before attacking. Actually, be it him, Listener, Spacey, Truman, or Caleb, these five people were all victims of that gene serum experiment. But now, in order to find V-16, some had already gone crazy. As Nora was thinking, Caleb sighed. It's not his fault. After his body was strengthened, Barbarian's character changed. He became more and more savage and very violent. Actually, among the children who were strengthened, some of them did not die from their body's rejection of the gene agent. At that time, those children were killed by Barbarian. Chapter 847 Call the Police A group of children had been detained since they were young and had never received an education. They were only given gene serum at fixed intervals. Just the thought of it was cruel. These children were indeed very pitiful. Brenda said calmly, but this doesn't become a reason for him to kill people. If people start taking revenge on society because of pitiful encounters in their childhood, then what need is there for the law? And what was the professor's fault in all this, why was he killed? Caleb and Nora nodded. Brenda's expression was filled with justice at this moment. She was no longer lazy when she spoke. She slowly said, however, the meaning of our existence is to protect this relative fairness. She looked at Nora and said slowly, Nora, I don't know why you're here, but the future of Stav University will be very chaotic. You're so thin and weak. Why don't you leave first? Tell me what you want and I'll help you. The, weak, Nora pursed her lips. Don't worry, I can protect myself. Brenda did not trust her but she also knew that she would definitely not shrink back from what her sister-in-law wanted to do. Therefore, she said seriously, Nora, then put my phone number on your speed dial. If you encounter danger, call me. I'll be there anytime you need. Also, it's best to keep your identity as anti-A secret to prevent Barbarian from targeting you. Don't worry, I'll catch him and kill him personally to avenge my brother. Advertisements. Brenda's voice turned cold when she said the last sentence. Okay. Nora replied silently. After Brenda finished talking to them, she looked at the time. A few of us are going to Stav University to investigate. Nora, if there's nothing else, I'll get going. With that, she looked at Caleb. And you, you're a spy. I don't think it's good to interact too much with Nora, you should avoid attracting barbarians' attention. You guys should maintain a distance. Caleb. Brenda had always been decisive despite looking like a rich lady, wearing high heels, a short skirt, and a mink coat. Nora saw that she was about to leave after saying that and hurriedly called out to her. Brenda. What's wrong? Brenda stopped in her tracks and looked at her. Is something the matter, Nora? Nora said, Solo wants to know where you are. Should I tell him? When Brenda heard the name Solo, she fell into a daze. Then, she sneered and lowered her eyes. She said in a light and cold voice, there's no need. Tell him not to look for me. He has no chance. I'm already sick of him. If he keeps pestering me, I'll be annoyed. He shouldn't be such a sore loser, right? With that, Brenda turned and left. Nora stared at her back for a while. Caleb asked, what's wrong? Nora lowered her eyes and replied calmly, something's wrong with her. Caleb. Nora noticed that he did not understand but she did not explain it. There was something wrong with Brenda. Usually, when she faced other men, she would always take the opportunity to flirt. But now, forget that she did not tease Caleb, she even let it go and went straight to the point. Clearly, she was not interested in other men anymore. It must be because of Solo that she was so frustrated. Moreover, when she said that she was sick of him earlier, although her eyes were lowered and covered it, Nora still saw the coldness in them. Brenda hated Solo. However, Solo said that when he and Brenda were glued together, Brenda had suddenly turned hostile. 
Logically speaking, if she suddenly turned hostile, she should be a little sorry for Solo. It shouldn't be resentment. There must be something else between Brenda and Solo. Nora called Solo. The call was picked up quickly. Solo asked, is she willing to see me? No. Nora replied, Solo, what happened between you and Brenda? Solo was stunned. What happened? I really don't know. Did I not wash my feet in bed? Nora. Or was it because I touched her head with my right hand when I woke up in the morning? Does she like me touching her with my left hand? Nora. Or is my cooking too bad? I told her to order takeout but she insisted on me making it myself. Sigh. Nora. Solo was about to cry. Auntie, tell me, what did I do wrong? Why is she ignoring me? I really, I'm almost 30 now. After so many years, I've finally fallen for a woman, help me. 1111. On the other hand, Brenda left and called her subordinate. Aaron, her subordinate, said, Captain Brenda, I'll gather our men immediately. Aaron, who was wearing a police uniform from Switzerland, was a tall white man. He was walking on the street and was about to meet Brenda when four people with bruises on their faces suddenly walked over. When Epson and his students saw him from afar, they rushed over as if they had seen their savior. Officer, someone beat us up. Aaron was a person with a strong sense of justice. He asked, who is it? An American woman, Epson shouted. Aaron immediately said, she beat up the four of you alone. Advertisements. When Epson heard this, he realized that it was very embarrassing. He nodded. I suspect she's American. She knows boxing. She's very strong. Officer, you should get a few more people over. Otherwise, I'm afraid you won't be her match alone. When Aaron heard this, he said, don't be afraid. My captain is nearby. I'll call her over. With that, Aaron made a call. Captain Brenda, there's a situation here. What? You're already nearby. You saw me. Okay. After Aaron hung up, Epson and the students immediately said, Officer, you have to punish that woman severely. She's really too detestable. She beat us up without any reason. Aaron, don't worry. Our captain is a high-ranking inspector who abhors evil. With her around, no one will be afraid. Even if an international mercenary came here, he probably won't be able to beat my captain. Epson was relieved. He had just been bullied by a woman, which made him very uncomfortable. Now, he finally had a chance to take revenge. He had to teach that woman a lesson. He had to send her to jail. Epson turned around and saw Brenda walking over. He proudly raised his head. Chapter 848 Digging His Own Grave When Brenda saw these people, she was stunned. She did not expect Aaron to be talking about these people. She walked over slowly. Wearing high heels, she swayed her hips and waist as she walked. She looked very attractive but her powerful combat skills made Epson and the others unable to have any charming thoughts. He thought about how the four of them had been beaten up by a woman, especially in front of the students. She had even asked him to apologize to Auntie. Epson decided to regain his face. He suddenly walked forward and said, Girl, do you see that? The police are here. If I call the police, how many years would you be in jail for beating the four of us? Brenda. She raised her eyebrows and sneered. When Epson saw her like this, he said again, it's not too late to beg for mercy now. Perhaps I'll be soft-hearted and agree to let you go. However, I want you to apologize for your actions earlier and kneel down to lick my shoes. Say a few words about how Auntie is inferior to me and this matter will be over. How about that? Brenda's sneer turned to a cold smile. I think your skin is itching again. When Epson heard this, he immediately said, you're too arrogant. You dare to threaten me in front of the police. All right, then don't regret it. I'll make your life in prison worse than death. Do you know what kind of life criminals get in jail? Brenda touched her chin. Yes, I really know. Advertisements. Epson said fiercely, it's good that you know. There are many barbaric people locked up in our prisons. They fight and commit all kinds of crimes. If a delicate woman like you goes in, you'll probably become their favorite toy. I bet your life there will be very easy. You won't be alone at night. Hee <laughs> hee. With that, he turned around and saw Aaron walking over. He hurriedly shouted, Officer, it's her. This woman beat the four of us up. 
Aaron, who came forward excitedly because he saw his captain, was speechless. He was stunned. He looked at Brenda in disbelief and then at Epson and the others. He asked in surprise, are you sure she hit you? Yes. Epson did not know at all that the show was about to start and shouted, please punish her severely. This woman is still so arrogant. She simply doesn't care about us. Officer, where's your captain? Quickly get her to come over and arrest this person. Brenda pursed her lips and stepped forward. Epson was instantly frightened and jumped behind Aaron. Officer, hurry up and arrest her. Aaron, the corners of his lips twitched as he looked at Brenda. Captain Brenda, what's going on? When Epson heard this, he was stunned. What did this police officer call her? Captain Brenda, why did the policeman call her Captain Brenda? As he was thinking, he heard Brenda's deep voice as she smiled charmingly. Yes, they insulted police officers behind my back. I had to teach them a lesson, of course. With that, she looked at Aaron and said, arrest them and lock them up for 24 hours. Yes, Aaron straightened and shouted. He immediately took out four handcuffs and walked to Epson. Epson, they had thought that they had just escaped a calamity but they did not expect that they would be going to jail. They would be detained for 24 hours, locked up with those hooligans. They might not have a good time tonight. Epson looked at Brenda pleadingly. He was about to speak when he saw the woman reach out a slender hand to her lips and gesture for him to keep quiet. Then, she looked at Aaron and smiled. Our professors and students love crowds a lot. You have to find them a good cell. Let them have some company tonight. Aaron nodded. Yes. Epson. The next day, when Nora went to school again, she heard Oscar say, Professor Epson is really awesome. Do you know, he and Professor Antti are both researching the same topic. Antti has not made any progress but Professor Epson already has an idea. He's about to succeed. Nora, she raised her eyebrows and asked, what project? Although there was some friction between her and Oscar previously, Oscar had always liked the strong. She had no objections to Nora now. On the other hand, Nora had never taken others seriously. Therefore, she did not have any grudges against Oscar, either. Oscar had become the only person in the class who could share info with her. Oscar said, the topic he's researching is about neurosuppression using gene improvement drugs. Anti has also studied this before. Unfortunately, she stopped because she couldn't succeed. But now, Professor Epson is about to succeed. Then, she lowered her voice and said, I heard that Professor Epson has always treated Auntie as his imaginary enemy and is secretly competing with her. Now that he has developed this project, he probably wants to slap Auntie's face and let her know that he is also very capable. He has declared war on Professor Auntie many times and asked her to come to Stav University for an academic debate. Professor Auntie did not ever dare to come. Nora, 1. She had not received this invitation at all. However, there were two reasons. Firstly, she never read irrelevant junk mail. Maybe Epson had really written a letter and she hadn't seen it. Secondly, Epson did not dare to issue a challenge at all. These words were just bold statements made for the outside world. Nora pouted. She did not take this matter to heart. After all, she had verified in the past if genes could suppress the nerves. It could not be done. Advertisements. She just had to wait patiently for Epson to fail. She did not say much. Soon, Epson's class began. When he walked to the podium, his legs were limp and there were some bruises on his face. He even covered his buttocks with one hand as if he had just undergone hemorrhoid surgery. When the class saw this, they all suppressed their laughter and did not dare to laugh. At this moment, Professor Epson suddenly said, I plan on inviting two students from our class to be my assistants. Who's interested? As soon as he said this, the students' attention was diverted. They raised their hands one by one. Me, me. It was like a king choosing his concubine at night. He looked at his classmates and nodded in satisfaction. Suddenly, he said, yes, Oscar. You can try. Then, the last person is... Amidst the expectations of the entire class, Epson smiled and suddenly looked at the last row. He slowly said, Lisa. Nora. She suddenly looked up and saw Epson say, as an exchange student from New York University School of Medicine, Lisa must know a little about Professor Antti, right? 
I heard that she also has her own laboratory and project team, so I'm giving you this chance to come to my laboratory to take a look. Compared to me, New York University School of Medicine is nothing. Chapter 849 I'm Anti. Nora narrowed her eyes. This Epson guy was really a troublemaker. She twitched her mouth and was about to reject him when Oscar said, Oh my god, that's awesome, Lisa. This way, we can work in a laboratory together. Professor Epson is awesome. He's giving an American exchange student a chance to learn. Okay, we're willing to give this chance to Lisa. Lisa, go, study hard. Yes, we're willing to let Lisa enjoy this honor. We also want her to have an unforgettable stay at Stav University. The students were very warm-hearted. All of them were very magnanimous, making Nora find it hard to reject them. If she rejected them now, it would seem like she did not know how to appreciate kindness. Never mind. Nora nodded. Sure. Advertisements. Epson's laboratory should also need the archive room to check the files. Then, she would go and see if there was a chance. After all, it would take time for Wayne's laboratory to get up and running. The project could not be started immediately. With the initial funding in place, Wayne still needed to gather sufficient graduate students. Of course, now that NTT had decided to support Wayne, many outstanding graduate students in the school had begun to sign up to participate in his projects. Wayne was flooded with success and was doing his job well. Then come with me to the laboratory after class. With that, Epson began the class. His class today was not difficult to understand. The main reason was that he had not slept well last night and was too tired. Therefore, he was not in the mood to make things difficult for the students and showcase his professionalism. They were done quickly. Oscar pulled Nora and followed behind Epson. At this moment, Nora's phone rang. She picked it up and glanced at it. It was a message from Brenda. Nora, that Epson spent last night in a cell. I took extra care of him to take revenge for you. Nora. She looked up again and saw Epson walking in front, limping and holding his waist. She suddenly felt that Epson was so professional. He made her, the culprit, admire him a little. At this moment, Oscar said, Professor Epson, are you okay? Do you need to rest today? Epson instantly said angrily, of course not. My project can be completed in two days. I have to complete finish it quickly and let the entire world see that she's inferior to me. The corners of Nora's mouth twitched. This person was persistent on his way to slap her. As she was thinking, Epson suddenly looked at her. Lisa, you're from New York University School of Medicine. You've seen Auntie, right? Nora, yes, I've seen her before. After all, although she could not see herself directly, she saw herself in the mirror every day. Epson immediately asked, is she very arrogant? Nora. Other than being a little lazy, she was not considered arrogant, right? When she did not speak, Epson sneered. I know that Auntie is the new star of your school. You definitely don't want to speak ill of her, but can she help you find glory? She can't. Only I'm willing to bring you into my laboratory. Therefore, in the future, who will be your mentor? Do you understand? Yeah, I do. Oscar also pulled Nora's arm. I know you won't belittle Professor Anti, but Professor Epson likes it when others mock her in front of him. Even if you don't mock her, don't side with Professor Anti. Otherwise, Professor Epson will be angry. Okay. Nora was helpless and anxious. She only knew about Epson from the email. She had never met him before. Why did this fellow treat her as his imaginary enemy? All right, we're here. Be careful what you say. With another warning, the two of them stopped in front of a room in the lab building with Epson. Epson took out his key card and opened the door. Nora looked inside and saw seven to eight graduate students in white coats busy researching topics. When they heard the voice, they turned around and saw Professor Epson. Everyone shouted, Professor Epson, you're more professional than Auntie. Nora. Epson smiled. Hello. We're on duty tonight. We have to get the project done and send the report as soon as possible. I can't wait to slap Auntie's face. A few people with bruises like his echoed together, not only do I want to slap her face, but I also want to hit her nose. I want to hit her in the face. I want her to never speak again. She can only bow down to us. I also want her to beg to join us. 
I heard that she has children in the country. I want her children to be ashamed of having such a mother. Nora. So their daily ritual was badmouthing Auntie. How great of a grudge was this? The corners of her mouth twitched as she heard Professor Epson say. All right, these two are my students. I'll get them to do the odd jobs. This is Oscar, the forever first in the class. Everyone looked at her. She was at a loss. Hello, seniors. Let's slap Auntie's face together. Advertisements. Nora. Epson looked at Nora again and introduced, this is an exchange student from New York University School of Medicine. She has seen Auntie in person. Along with this sentence, everyone looked at Nora. Nora. Everyone was confused. Seeing that she was silent for a long time, Oscar poked her arm. Say it. You'll hit Auntie's face. Nora. I can't say it. Why? The others also glared at her. Nora coughed. Because I'm Auntie. Chapter 850 Meeting. There was silence in the laboratory. A few moments later, Oscar coughed. What did you say? How can you be Auntie? You're Lisa. Oh I know, what you mean is that you and Auntie are not only from the same country but also from the same school of medicine, so you and she are similar, right? Nora. Before she could speak, the others had already opened their mouths. That must be the case. If she really was Auntie, why would she come over as an exchange student here? Hey, you are so unappreciative. Professor Epson gave you such a great opportunity, yet you don't know how to cherish it. Is it because you think Auntie is great? Then why don't you work on a project under her instead? Besides, can she even complete the project? Upon hearing this, Nora replied, because there's no way this project can be completed. Everyone retorted angrily at once. How is it impossible? We're almost done. There are no borders in academics. You should be looking at which professor is better rather than blindly working behind closed doors. Professor Epson, she is so ungrateful, I think you'd better kick her out. As Epson listened to everyone around him, he looked at Nora again and sneered, no, I must keep her here. Everyone, Epson said to Nora, you think Auntie is great, right? Then I will show you that I am better than her. I will also let you verify with your own eyes whether this project will be successfully completed or not. I will show that Auntie is nothing. In terms of scientific research, we here at Stav University are the best. All right, don't stand around here to talk. Split up and get to work. One by one, the rest of the students left the area around Epson. All of them curled their lips disdainfully at Nora and some even gave her the finger to express their contempt. Oscar also quietly tugged at Nora's sleeve. Even if you like Professor Auntie, don't speak up for her anymore, okay? Nora. This was just so, she couldn't even leave despite wanting to. She asked, is there anything that needs to be checked at the archive? She was still thinking about going to the archives to look for file no. 004. Someone replied, yeah, there is. I need you to go to the archives to look up file number. 102. But before he could finish, Epson sneered and said, no, no, she doesn't have to do anything. She just needs to witness our success. As soon as Epson said this, no one dared to assign her work anymore. The undergraduate who should have been worked to the bone had now become an idler. Nora fell silent for a while. Then, she simply sat in the rest area at the side. Just like that, she watched as Oscar busied herself here and there. Under their directions, she printed documents and did things that would never come within a mile of core content. Soon, it was noon. At the request of the professor, Oscar went out to buy lunch, but when she brought it back she found that there wasn't any for Nora. Oscar was very apologetic. I didn't know that there was one portion fewer. They refused to give you one. Nora wasn't bothered. Then I'll just go out and eat by myself. She stood up. When she was about to go out, Epson sneered, you have to be back by 1 p.m. Otherwise, I won't give you any credits at all. Nora ignored him and went out. She wasn't really an exchange student, so she had no need for credits. After having lunch at the cafeteria, she was about to go back to the lab when she ran into Jack again. At the sight of her, Jack stepped forward and said with a smile, Lisa. What a coincidence. We meet again. Nora had half a smile on her face. Yeah, what a coincidence indeed. 
Jack scratched his head. Actually, it's not really a coincidence. I was waiting for you. I circled the cafeteria five times before I finally saw you. Nora, he sure was direct. She lowered her eyes and asked, why were you waiting for me? Jack said, I heard that there's a serial killer in the school, so I thought I would protect you. Don't be scared, I can take you home. 2. 11. Nora raised her eyebrows, not expecting such an answer. How did you know about the serial killer? She asked. Jack laughed. It's all over the school. Several SWAT cars have entered our campus and there are SWAT officers patrolling all the entrances and exits now. SWAT officers. Did that mean that Brenda was also here? While she was thinking about it, her cell phone rang. When she lowered her head and answered, she found that it was solo. Hey auntie, I'm at the gates of the school but the management is too strict. They don't allow anyone without a student ID to enter. Why's that? Isn't the Stav University campus free to enter? I'll pick you up at the gates. Nah, you don't have to. Solo sighed and said, just come to the SWAT team's temporary detention room on campus. Nora. Oh, they didn't let me in just now even when I insisted on it, so I stole someone's student ID. They found out about it, so I've been brought in. Nora's lip corners spasmed and she suddenly raised her eyebrows. Well, okay, I'll come right over. She hung up the phone and walked over to the detention room leisurely. Outside the detention room, Brenda sneered at her subordinate and said, Let's go, I want to see who has the balls to talk so big and say that he'll make sure we can't use our network if we don't let him go. Ha. Huh. Chapter 851 Brenda's Troubles When Nora walked over, she happened to hear Brenda, so all the more she wasn't in a hurry anymore. She even walked over two steps slower, stood outside the door, and peeked inside. Brenda pushed the door open and entered. Her cold expression froze when she saw Solo. Solo was ranting at the other SWAT officers. I told you, I'm here to look for someone. How can you arrest me so indiscriminately? Hurry up and let me go. If you don't, I won't let you guys off. But when he saw Brenda, Solo's expression instantly changed. He was so fierce just now, but he suddenly became cautious in an instant. Brenny. Nora who was standing outside the door, suddenly felt a wave of disgust. Brenny, what a mushy nickname. The SWAT officers were also stunned. They looked at Solo and then at Brenda. Finally, they asked, do you know each other? Yes. No. Solo and Brenda answered at the same time. Aaron, the SWAT officer, became even more confused. Captain Brenda, do you know him or not? No. Yes. Solo and Brenda answered at the same time again, except that they had switched answers this time. Solo thought that perhaps Brenda didn't want to admit in public that he was her boyfriend, so he changed his stance. But Brenda knew that if she denied knowing him, it would be very difficult for Solo to get out. When the two simultaneously switched stances, Aaron looked at them again in confusion. Suddenly, realization dawned upon him. Oh, I get it. He looked at Solo. Boyfriend. Solo nodded immediately. Just as he was about to say yes, Brenda straight up denied it. No. With a cold look, she added, but I know who he is. He's not barbarian, you can release him. Aaron nodded. Okay. After Solo was released, Brenda turned around and walked out. Solo followed after her and asked, Brenny, you admitted to knowing me just now. Is it because you were worried that I would be detained? I still have a place in your heart, right? Brenda took a deep breath, turned around, and said word by word, Listen, I would have said the same thing even if it was someone else. Because this is my job. I want to rule all the suspicious people out. Her words stunned Solo, and a somewhat lonely expression came over his face. But I'm not just anyone. Didn't you say that you like me? And that you also like being with me? You even told me to listen to you and do as you say. Brenda lowered her eyes, which seemed somewhat chilly. Her lips slowly curled into a sneer and she said, If you are really willing to do as I say, then you should leave immediately and never appear before me ever again. But why? Solo, who didn't understand, pressed further. I told you, Brenda said word by word, I'm tired of you. Solo stepped in front of her and blocked her way. Brenny, I don't believe what you say at all, you're not someone like that. 
It was obviously your first time when you were with me. My first time, you must be dreaming. Hey, I've already fooled around with at least 90 men maybe even a hundred and you are nothing among them. So, don't pester me anymore. After Brenda said that, she took out a blank check. Or is it money that you want? How much do you want? I can give it to you. Solo stood where he was, terribly aggrieved. I'm not doing it for money. Then forget it. Brenda kept the check back in her pocket. Then, with both hands on the holster at her waist, she strode away. Brenda had put on the Swiss police uniform for work today. The uniform made her legs look long and her waist thin and slender, she looked cool and alpha in it. The moment she walked out, she attracted the gazes of everyone around her. Aaron, who was outside, hurriedly followed her when he saw her coming out. Solo came after her the moment she left the room but before he could catch up with her, he saw Brenda suddenly put an arm around Aaron's shoulder. She said with a low giggle, Hey handsome, come to my room tonight. Let's exchange tips on how to catch criminals. Her voice was charming and extraordinarily seductive when she said it. It was just like that time when she had knocked on Solo's door and stood outside looking at him. Solo froze. Seeing Brenda's behavior, Aaron immediately smiled and put his arm around her waist. Sure thing, Captain Brenda. I have long wanted to have an in-depth exchange with you. The two went farther and farther and even flirted with each other. Solo stared at them, unable to speak for the longest time. After Brenda and Aaron turned a corner, the two suddenly stopped and separated from each other at the same time. Brenda said, thanks. Aaron grinned. No problem, Captain Brenda. After working together for so many years, we do have some tacit understanding between us. Was that your boyfriend? Brenda's expression turned sad but her eyes were still cold. Not anymore. Aaron wanted to ask further, but Brenda said, these are not things you should be asking about. Aaron immediately made a gesture of zipping his mouth, indicating that he wouldn't say any more. Only then did Brenda begin to give instructions. All the labs must be emptied tonight, no one is to stay for experiments. This is to prevent Barbarian from killing anyone at night. Everyone he attacked is involved with biomedicine, so we must focus on protecting those people. Yes, ma'am. Aaron straightened his back, answered affirmatively, and left. After he left, Brenda let out a deep breath. At this moment, Nora suddenly appeared beside her. She fixedly looked at Brenda and asked, what on earth is going on between you and Solo? Brenda pressed her lips together tightly at the question. She was about to speak when Nora interrupted her. I saw everything you and Aaron did just now, Brenda. Don't use lame excuses to dismiss me again. Brenda paused. She looked at Nora. Her eyes suddenly reddened and she chuckled softly. In a soft whisper, she said, Nora, I'd always thought that the world was very big, but why is it actually so small? Upon hearing her emotional sigh, Nora held her shoulders and asked. What on earth happened? Chapter 852 You have no right to interfere with my freedom. Brenda narrowed her eyes. Don't ask any more, Nora. I just can't be with him. Solo found his way here because you gave him the address, right? Don't do that again. After she said that in a low voice, she raised her head again and went back to her usual calm and lazy self. After all, with him around, I won't be able to go to other handsome guys anymore. Right. Seeing how Brenda looked like she didn't want to say anything, Nora knew that she had probably done something wrong this time. Perhaps she shouldn't have told Solo where Brenda was but she had always felt that a lot of issues between people were only caused by misunderstandings. It was just like Tanya and Joel back then. There had been so many misunderstandings between the two of them. If they didn't meet or contact each other, how were they ever going to resolve the misunderstandings between them? That was why she wanted to let Solo and Brenda meet and talk things out. But judging from Brenda's behavior just now, it seemed that she had no intentions of explaining anything at all. Nora paused for a moment before she slowly said, Brenda, I think it'd be best if there aren't any misunderstandings between you two. Those corny TV dramas and novels are too exaggerated. We're all adults here. Moreover, times are moving so fast these days. If there really is some kind of misunderstanding, then it would do everyone good to explain everything clearly. Brenda lowered her eyes. 
There is no misunderstanding between him and I, Nora, I know very well what I am doing. Seeing that she was still unwilling to reveal more, Nora nodded. Okay, I won't interfere with you guys. Thanks. Brenda and Nora were both straightforward people. After the two talked it out, Brenda said, I just want to catch Barbarian now. As for Solo, I'll leave him to you. Yeah, okay. Brenda left after saying that. Nora remained where she was and looked at her from the back. Brenda was very professional. After she went into the distance, she picked up the walkie-talkie and started to contact the people stationed in every direction. They were required to report every 10 minutes to prevent Barbarian from breaking through from any direction. As for Nora, she went back where she came from and turned the corner to see Solo standing there blankly. When Nora first met Solo, he had been seriously injured. His lungs had been punctured and he looked like he wouldn't survive. The guy had only survived because Nora had operated on him. Was. Even when he was seriously injured, the man was never serious. After owing her a favor, every time he had to do something for her, he had always done so very reluctantly. This was the first time Nora had ever seen him look so lost and dejected. She walked over and asked, are you going back? No. Solo shook his head. I don't believe she would do something like this. I want to stay and find out why she's doing this. It wasn't easy for me to finally fall for a woman after all this time. I can't just give up like that. Nora kept quiet for a moment but did not dissuade him. Solo then looked at her again. So, can you find me a place to stay? Nora, was he gonna cling to her now? She replied, it's not like you don't have any money. Go and get a hotel room for yourself. I can't stay at a hotel. Solo followed behind her and said pitifully, didn't I tell you? I broke the law. Nora's lip corners spasmed a little. When she recalled how Solo had told her upon his arrival in America that Interpol was after him in Switzerland. She asked, what did you do? Solo scratched his head. It's actually nothing serious. All I did was compete with a white hat and hack into his computer. After that, those petty guys started to come after me. A white hat referred to a hacker who served the government. Solo had always been flamboyant in his way of doing things, so Nora didn't find it strange that he would do something like that. The corners of her lips spasmed a little and she sighed. Fine. Corn. Nora took him to a hotel, booked a room for Solo with her fake ID, and paid for a five-day stay. Five days later, if you still haven't gotten everything settled, you'll have to find some place to stay by yourself, said a heartless Nora. Solo. Seeing that Nora was leaving, Solo grabbed her. What kind of mission is Brenny on here? Isn't she just a nobody policewoman? Why did she come to Switzerland? To arrest a serial killer. Solo's expression changed. Isn't that very dangerous? As. Solo had been studying computers all this time, so he was cooped up indoors all year round. Although he was pretty tall, he was skinny and barely had any flesh on him. Nora glanced at his body disdainfully, not sure why Brenda had fallen in love with him. He wouldn't even last a punch from her or Brenda. Solo said anxiously, then I'm going to protect her tonight. Nora curled her lips disdainfully. You, forget about it. If you go, she'll be in even more danger. Because she would have to protect him. Solo. Solo's lip corners spasmed and he said nothing. Nora didn't bother with Solo anymore and left the hotel. He was already nearly 30 years old, surely he could take care of himself, right? Nora kept walking around the campus. To be honest, she could also just charge into the archives and look for file no. 004. However, with Barbarian nearby, she shouldn't do that. If she did, then she would be outright telling him that the V-16 was in the archives. She couldn't beat Barbarian in a fight, so she mustn't let him take the lead. She could only outsmart him and use a reasonable excuse to check out file no. 004. It seemed that she could only approach it using Wayne's project. When she thought of this, Nora started walking towards the laboratory building. As soon as she entered, she heard quarreling coming from ahead. Originally, she wasn't intending to pay attention to it, but in the midst of the quarrel, she heard Brenda's voice. She turned around and walked over only to find Epson and Brenda arguing. Brenda was dressed in professional attire and looked very smart. 
She had one hand on her hip and the other raised as she checked the time. You must leave this place by five o'clock at the latest. Epson replied angrily, I'm not going to leave. My experimental project is about to be completed. You must be doing this because of Auntie, right? You don't want me to finish my experiments quickly, for fear that it'll slap her in the face. Hey, Officer Hunt, you are just a police officer. We have all the permissions to work on our experiments here. You have no right to interfere with my freedom. Chapter 853 Epson digs his own grave. Behind Brenda was Aaron. When he heard Epson, he said, it's for your own good that we're telling you guys to leave. Nighttime is the peak period for murders. Also, this particular serial has a strange pattern. Once he starts, he kills a person a day until he has killed enough. His targets this time are people involved in biomedicine, like you. You guys are our key protection targets. Epson sneered. That's a nice way of saying it, but why do we have to stop while the lab next door doesn't? Aaron was simply rendered speechless. I told you, his targets are people involved in biomedicine, especially professors specializing in genetics. The professor next door is not involved with biomedicine, so he will be fine, of course. However, Epson didn't believe him. The way I see it, all these murderers and whatnot are all things that you guys made up, right? I haven't heard of anyone who has died. Besides, everything was very normal in school today. Captain Brenda, I just insulted Auntie, that's all, isn't it? I know that you and Auntie are both Americans and that she may even be your relative, so you don't want me to continue with my project. Ha, huh, do you think I won't know what your objective is? Brenda, she was dumbfounded. What objective do I have? How come I don't know anything about it? Epson said, I've already asked my friends in America. Professor Anti has been conducting experimental research recently and her research is on genetics. She also hasn't shown herself for several days. Hey, did she hear about my progress? Is that why she's burying herself into her research and trying to finish her project ahead of me? As for you, you made up a story about some murderer to disturb me and delay my progress. I'm not stupid, I've already seen through your ploy. Brenda, Nora, who just came over. No matter what, she had to provide an explanation as to why she had suddenly disappeared in America. Thus, she had told Lily to say that she was conducting research, and therefore, not seeing guests. She didn't expect Epson to spin such a story in his head, though. To be honest, before she came to Stav University, she didn't even know who Epson was. The corners of her lips spasmed. Being seen as an imaginary enemy or whatnot was really irritating. Brenda replied, my sister-in-law isn't conducting any research. You've misheard. Sister-in-law, hey, I see, so you and auntie have ties like that. No wonder you're doing so much for her. Do you think I'd believe she isn't doing any research just because you say so? In any case, my lab mustn't halt progress tonight. Epson simply refused to listen. Brenda took a deep breath. I am in charge of campus security now, so everyone should comply with my arrangements. If you refuse to obey orders, don't blame me for taking action against you. And how are you going to do that? Epson sneered, keep that for the scaredy cats, I won't be fooled. In any case, you don't have to say any more. My lab will not halt progress tonight. After he spoke, he looked at the students. Whoever wants to leave early, feel free to do so. I won't stop you. As soon as he said that, the students looked at the police and then at Epson. Then, one by one, they stood beside him. I'm not leaving, professor. Neither am I. I want to quickly finish this for the professor. We are only one step away from success. Yeah, we've already worked overtime for half a month. After working so hard for so long, we are just left with two days of work. How can we give up now? We must continue the experiments. We have the freedom to do what we want. You have no right to interfere. Yes, that's right. If the police force us to comply with orders and prevent us from conducting our experiments, then I will report you to your superiors. She looked at the ignorant people in front of her, so mad that she was about to pop a vein or two. Brenda, she looked at the ignorant people in front of her, so mad that she was about to pop a vein or two. 
In the end, she looked at Epson, sneered, and said, Fine, you can stay if you want but please sign this waiver of liability for not obeying our instructions. Otherwise, I have to take full responsibility for any accidents. She couldn't be bothered if some people wanted to court death. She was a member of Interpol. She was only responsible for arresting Barbarian. She wasn't going to pay any more attention to these idiots. Brenda had never claimed to be a messiah. After solving so many global cases over the years, she'd already seen through a lot of mundane things in life. Upon hearing what she said, Epson sneered. Do you think we will be fooled if you use such things to scare us? There are so many professors of biomedicine, I'm just a nobody among them. Even if the murderer or whatever really exists, they won't target me. Besides, you guys are the ones who keep bringing up the serial killer, we have never seen him before. What's the big deal about signing the agreement? I'll sign it for you. I will take responsibility for my own life. After speaking, Epson stepped forward and signed the disclaimer that Brenda handed over. Brenda then looked at the students. You must also take responsibility for their lives. Epson scoffed. Of course. Okay. Brenda took back the papers. Out of professional courtesy, she reminded him once more, we will be patrolling nearby. At any time, if you see anyone suspicious, make sure to yell. We will come over right away. Epson's response, however, was, don't worry, we won't give you the opportunity to enter the lab to search for anything. You can forget about stealing the results of my experiments for Auntie. Brenda. Chapter 854 Competing with Auntie. Brenda felt that there was something wrong with the man's brain, but she was accustomed to people demanding freedom of action and had already learned ways to deal with it. After bringing her men out of the laboratory, Brenda said to Aaron, get a few more people to patrol the laboratory building tonight. Out of the professional ethics of an international special forces officer, she ultimately still had her moral responsibilities. Aaron nodded. Roger that, Captain Brenda. After the two spoke, Brenda left and went someplace else to make more arrangements. In the laboratory building, after Brenda left, Epson looked at the rest of the group. All right, let's continue work, guys. After speaking, he suddenly asked, Lisa, where are you going? Nora, who had turned around and was about to leave. She looked back and raised her eyebrows. Home. She had three hungry babies to feed at home. There was no way she would stay here and work overtime with them. Besides, if Barbarian was going to show up tonight, then it would be the safest to leave this place, both for herself and for everyone else in the school. However, Epson got mad. Did I say you can go? You are also a member of the lab, how can you just leave without the consent of your supervisor? Nora stood still and asked, oh, can I go then? Epson. He was about to refuse when Nora said, you said it yourself just now everyone is free to choose whether they want to stay or not. Some people choose to trust you, others choose to trust the police. I also have the right and freedom to choose to go home now, right? Her argument shut Epson up. Nora then looked at Oscar and said, the SWAT would never make trouble unreasonably. Since she can get the school to give her the authority, that means she is no ordinary person. Why are you people so reluctant to trust them? What are you going to do if you really meet with danger? Her words made Oscar waver. She looked at Epson and said, Professor. I, before she could even finish, Epson became even more furious. What? Do you believe her nonsense too? If you do, then you can also go with her. Oscar heaved a sigh of relief. Then I'll go for now. I'll come over early in the morning tomorrow to bring breakfast for you and the seniors. But right after, Epson sneered and said, your seniors are all working overtime while the two of you are just here to share the fruits of their labor, yet you can't even do something like staying up late. In that case, what do I need you for in my lab? You guys can leave, but once you do, you will be seen as having withdrawn from my experiment. This made Oscar stop. She looked at Nora with a wry smile. Lisa, the professor is indeed giving us credit by having us here. It doesn't seem appropriate to leave at this time. Oscar would never miss any opportunity to climb the ladder and boost her resume. Nora was very calm, though. Yeah, okay. Since that's the case, then I withdraw. Her understatement-like reaction angered Epson. 
Epson looked at her, finding the girl a total ingrate. He was giving her such a wonderful project for free, yet she didn't even want it. Was it because she thought Auntie was better than him? Epson was livid. He pointed at her and snapped, fine, fine. If you want to withdraw, then go ahead. To think I originally wanted to give you a chance. I hope you won't regret this two days later. Nora raised her eyebrows. She looked at the rest of the students in the lab and spoke up for Brenda again. Compared to our lives, no form of glory is worth mentioning. After saying that, she turned and left. Her remark caused unrest among the students. Someone a little more timid couldn't help but say, Professor Epson, why don't we listen to the police? To be honest, even if the results are delayed by two days, Auntie should not be able to make it ahead of us. Yeah, Professor, we. However, Epson only looked at them as though he had expected better from them. All of you are too naive. Do you know how scheming Auntie is? She has not shown up in America for several days. This shows that she is putting everything she has into her research right now. She must know that we are mocking her, so she is working overtime. We are fighting a battle against time right now. Whoever successfully develops it first will win. Everyone looked at one another. Finally, someone couldn't help but raise their doubts. Auntie just didn't show herself, that's all. Hasn't she always been mysterious? No one could find her. Maybe she's just sleeping. Lily had once publicly stated that Auntie didn't have that much time because she needed to sleep 12 to 16 hours a day. Thus, she really didn't have time to do anything else. Epson sighed. Do you actually believe that? The person continued to retort. But what if Auntie is not researching this topic at all? Epson sneered and puffed out his chest confidently. How can that be? Although I, Epson, am a nobody at Stav University, I am still a little famous internationally. She definitely knows me and pays attention to me. She also sees me as her rival. She is undoubtedly anxious and competing with me for time right now. Just you wait. Once we finish the project one step ahead of her, she will definitely jump out and say, Oh, I am also working on this project, I'm just not as fast as you guys. Epson curled his lips disdainfully. She sure is arrogant. Now that Epson had put it that way, everyone believed him. They all took it seriously and said, then we have to be one step ahead of Auntie. Let's work overtime. Professor, we are ready. We'll do this for the sake of your honor. Okay, I'm counting on you guys. Epson frowned and then said loudly, it's not just for my sake but also for the honor of Stav University. I thank everyone in advance. Even he was awfully moved by himself. This time, he would definitely be able to suppress Auntie. He would make that arrogant woman bow down before him. As for that murderer or whatever, hey, there's no way he would come to him, right? Chapter 855 A Complaint Nora, who had been set as an imaginary enemy, didn't give two hoots about whether Epson's experimental project was successful or not. When she returned home, she found the house pretty lively. When she pushed open the door and entered, she saw an uninvited guest Renee. Renee still looked as timid as ever and her head was lowered. However, she had taken a bath, so her hair was a lot smoother. There wasn't a bad smell on her anymore either. Although her clothes were plain and even had patches in some places, they were clean. Cherry was offering her snacks to her. Renee, try it. Don't be afraid. It's delicious. Renee was so frightened that she pushed the snack back to her. And no, it's okay. I don't eat them. Have some. It's fine, I can't finish so many snacks anyway, yeah. Cherry's large eyes blinked, she smiled and said again. Renee shook her hands again. Cherry didn't press any further. The moment she took away the snacks, Nora saw Renee breathe a sigh of relief obviously, she was scared of socializing. But since she was so afraid of socializing, why was she here? While she was thinking about it, when Renee saw her enter, she was so shocked that she immediately stood up. M.M. Miss Smith. I'm not M.M. Miss Smith. My name is Lisa. Renee was stunned for a moment. Nora's voice was still as low as ever as she said, well, just kidding. You don't have to call me Miss Smith, you can just call me Lisa. A touch of gentleness flashed across Renee's eyes when she sensed her kindness. People who lived in a world filled with malice would be grateful for every little bit of kindness that others showed them. 
That was exactly how Renee looked at the moment, grateful. She lowered her head and whispered, I, I'm here to thank you. 4. While asking, Nora looked at Xander. There were still two months left, so Xander was in very stable condition at the moment. Renee continued to speak softly. Liam got promoted because you helped him, right? Thank you. You're welcome. Nora looked at her. I was the one who dragged him into it, so of course I had to do something. Renee breathed a sigh of relief again. Then, she pointed to the cake on the table and said, I I made that myself. Why you and the children can try it. The three little fellows would never touch things their neighbors gave them until she got home. Nora was very satisfied with their manners. She nodded. Thank you. Renee became self-conscious again, though, she also felt relieved having completed her task. T then I'll go first. Nora waited until she left before she walked to the door and looked out. Sure enough, she saw Liam waiting for Renee outside. Renee's eyes lit up when she saw him. She walked over and took his arm. She looked very clingy. When she whispered something, Liam nodded. Obviously, Renee had taken the initiative to visit them because of Liam's instructions. Was he trying to please her because he knew that Nora was a high-level executive at NTT? Nora did not feel much about it, though. After all, this was human nature. Soon, night fell. At Stav University's laboratory building. Etson was actually very scared. After all, everyone else in the building had obediently halted their experiments and gone back. If there really was a murderer, there would be no one to kill except them. Thus, even though he was very sleepy, he still kept his spirits high and kept an eye outside. Slowly, bit by bit, the clock moved from 9 o'clock to 5 in the morning. Seeing that the sky was gradually brightening, Epson slowly relaxed. He even walked over to the students and said jokingly, See, a whole night has passed, there are no murderers at all. Those people were just trying to scare us. It's fortunate that we didn't leave and end up wasting this precious night. I'm going to complain to the university president tomorrow. And tell him that those SWAT officers are simply running too wild in the school, which has seriously affected our lives and work progress. Chapter 856 Barbarian's Modus Operandi Everyone laughed when Epson said that. It gradually became bright outside. One by one, the Stav University professors reported for work. Students also gradually woke up in the dormitories and went for their classes. Everyone had believed Brenda when she said with absolute conviction that Barbarian would definitely take action after all, Interpol had extraordinary status. Regardless, Epson still went to the university president's office and told him that the serial murderers or whatnot didn't exist at all. He even pointed out something angrily and said, Professor Mayer was probably killed at home by people seeking revenge on him, but that group of people are not only clinging onto this but even carrying this over to a serial killer hypothesis. This is just the police's excuse for their incompetence. There are so many projects to be done at Stav University, are we really going to follow their instructions and leave work on time every day? This is ridiculous. Upon hearing Epson, the other professors and students rushing their work also approached the president to lodge their complaints. Our projects cannot afford any more delays. Since nothing went wrong in Professor Epson's lab last night, this means it's okay for us to work after hours too. Yeah, we can't halt our progress just because of a murderer who may not even exist. If our progress is affected, it will also affect Stav University. The president couldn't hold up under the pressure of so many people, so he went to Brenda. Captain Brenda, I know you guys are from Interpol, but nothing has happened at all last night. The murder pattern of that serial killer, Barbarian, you mentioned, is that once he starts killing, he must kill one person every day before he'll stop, but no one died last night. The professors and students have begun to raise objections and they are complaining that your regulatory measures are too strict. Brenda, who was dressed in a military uniform, straightened her back. She looked at the president and slowly asked, Are you sure there is nothing wrong with all the professors? Yes, I'm sure. The president sighed. Although we are morally obligated to cooperate with you, nothing of the sort that you mentioned happened yesterday, so I think you must be mistaken. It's impossible that barbarian would be in the school. 
Alternatively, maybe the screening was done well yesterday, so he didn't have a chance to enter the school at all. I'm afraid we can't cooperate with you anymore. Brenda explained nervously, Sir, yesterday's situation was indeed unexpected and non-conforming to Barbarian's killing pattern, but trust me, I have been tracking him for three years now. There's no way I would be wrong. He must be the one who killed that professor on the first day. He's definitely here in Stav University. The principal replied, I believed you when you told me this yesterday. When I asked you if you had any evidence, you told me that you were basing this on intuition. But Captain Brenda, there are times when one's intuition can go wrong. Do you have any actual evidence? For example, traces of himself that barbarian leaves behind after he kills someone. A stern-faced Brenda explained, he has always been cautious and doesn't leave anything but a poker card behind after he murders someone. When Professor Mayer died, there was a poker card in his home. The president sighed. But what if the murderer deliberately did that to mislead you? So that you'll suspect it's barbarian. The school carries out and researches hundreds of projects every year and many of them are pressed for time. They really can't afford to be delayed. Captain Brenda, do you think? Brenda's expression tensed up and she said, Sir, do you know who barbarian is? He has gone on five killing sprees during the past three years, and each time, he killed five people in a row before he stopped. Some of them might have been bad eggs, but some of them were also innocent citizens. In order to kill someone, Barbarian once placed a bomb and killed an entire bus full of people with him. He has no concept of life at all. It's most dangerous when there are many students in the school. I don't think you would want murders to take place, either, right? Once Barbarian shows up, if there are too many people around, there will be countless casualties. Are you sure you really don't care? Brenda's words made the president's jaw tense up. After a while, he sighed and said, fine, you've convinced me again. But if the situation still differs from what you say after tonight, then we may not be able to cooperate with you anymore. Brenda nodded. No problem. When she came out, Aaron came forward at once. He said, Captain Brenda, what on earth is up with Barbarian? He didn't do anything last night. The professors and students are all calling us good for nothings now and some are even telling our men stationed at their positions what to do. Our guys are all feeling really awful. Aaron gritted his teeth in fury and added, that guy named Epson is especially bad. He brought his students with him and openly called us incompetent. Chapter 857 found it. When Brenda heard this, a sharp look came into her eyes and she lowered her gaze. She said, tell our guys not to listen to them. They are just a bunch of ignorant and pedantic students. Aaron nodded. But right after, he heaved a deep sigh. Everyone understands that, it's just that we are all so anxious. Did we really make an error in judgment this time? Is Barbarian not here? He's here. Brenda was very sure. Firstly, the way Professor Mayer was killed completely matched Barbarian's modus operandi. Secondly, Caleb was here. Additionally, he also clearly stated that Truman had only sent him here to look for leads after he got to know of Barbarian's whereabouts. Therefore, Barbarian must be in Stav University. But why was it that they simply couldn't find him? Aaron couldn't help but say, we kept everyone unrelated to the school out of campus yesterday. Was he unable to get in? That's why he didn't take any action. The professors all had their own living quarters in the staff dormitories, so none of them had gone home the day before. All of them had stayed in the dormitories. Therefore, the whole school was currently sealed off. Had Barbarian really been unable to get in as a result? Brenda found it unlikely, though. For Barbarian to walk away unscathed every time after he killed so many people, what he relied on was precisely his strong fighting abilities. A door wouldn't be able to shut him out. Brenda couldn't help looking at Aaron once more. Get someone to verify once more whether all the professors came for work normally today. Aaron nodded. I have already contacted Peter, the director cooperating with our investigation of the professors and students this whole time, just now. He has confirmed that all professors have reported for classes and also that there are no students or professors absent from classes so far. Brenda frowned. She was very puzzled. While she was thinking, a few people, who looked like students, passed by her. 
When they saw her, they pointed at her and said, You see that woman there? That's the woman. She's from Interpol. She must be why the police are so incompetent this time. First of all, women can't compare to men because they tend to become emotional in their way of handling things. Just now, I heard that she determined that we're facing a serial murderer because of her intuition. What kind of times are we living in? Does anyone solve cases with their intuition? Also, she said yesterday that someone would definitely be killed last night, so a lot of policemen were dispatched to handle the situation. But not only was there no news of anyone being killed, the lab that worked overtime last night even turned out fine. I really don't understand why the president is cooperating with them. Sai, our project was originally supposed to be completed with just two more nights of overtime but it was postponed all because of her. Even the investors have become unhappy about this. Ours, too. Epson said that the whole school was very quiet last night and nothing happened at all. He also said that she's doing all this for Auntie. Auntie. What does it have to do with Auntie? The officer said that Auntie is her sister-in-law. Auntie is currently conducting research in the US on the same topic as Epson, so the two of them are racing against time to see who can clinch the project first. That's why the officer made up a ridiculous excuse like this to make things difficult for Epson. Unfortunately for her, he was not fooled. Our professor didn't dare to take responsibility for potential accidents, so he obeyed their instructions, but Epson signed a waiver saying that he would take responsibility if anything happens in his lab. The two left while discussing the incident in low voices. Aaron was furious. He wanted to go up and reason with them but Brenda held him back. Ignore them, she said. Aaron took a deep breath. Brenda wanted to say something, but out of the corner of her eye, she suddenly glimpsed a familiar figure in the corner ahead. She cast her eyes down, suddenly took Aaron's arm, and said, All right, Aaron, let's talk business instead. Aaron. However, he lived up to the name of being long-term partners with Brenda and immediately understood what she meant. Right off the bat, he said. Sure. Have you had lunch? You must be exhausted after the busy morning. Let's have lunch first. Okay. After Brenda answered, the two walked off intimately. Only after they went into the distance did Solo come out of the corner. The skinny man clenched his fists tightly, awfully mad. He asked Nora beside him, how am I inferior to that officer? Nora replied, you are not as tall as him. Her one-liner pierced Solo's chest like a knife. Solo retorted, aren't I just a little shorter than him? You're not as strong and muscular as him. A second knife was plunged into Solo's chest. Nora looked Solo up and down. Apart from your face, which is still not too bad, everything else about you seems to be inferior to him. Solo. He felt that a rain of blades had just showered on him. Solo heaved a silent sigh and lowered his head. No matter how much better he is than me, Brenny likes me, not him. Nora, are you that confident? She asked. Of course. Solo said, do you think I'll get into a relationship with someone so casually? I know Brenny was up to no good when she first approached me, but her feelings for me, later on, were genuine. I feel the same way towards her too. Sana, I just want to know why on earth Brenny is ignoring me. There must be something wrong in here. Nora nodded. She also knew that something was wrong, but if Brenda refused to say anything, then she couldn't do anything either. Elsewhere, Brenda and Aaron went to the school cafeteria. As it was lunchtime, there were a lot of people there. When the pair entered, many students started to gesture at and talk about them. Of course, public opinion was not overwhelmingly one-sided. There were still quite a fair number of people who spoke up for them. The police are just doing this in the name of prudence. It'd be best that the murderer doesn't exist, but what if it's true? Projects are important but when compared with our lives, aren't our lives still more important? Aaron paid attention to the ongoings around him as he ate. Our lives are indeed important but these rumors are really wrong. Everyone knows that Barbarian has to kill for five consecutive days once he goes on a killing spree. Since nothing happened last night, this means that there is absolutely no problem. It's not Barbarian. The students were extremely concerned about the case, so everyone was discussing it. Even Aaron couldn't help but start to doubt himself. He said, Captain Brenda, are you sure it's really barbarian? 
Peter has confirmed with me again that all the professors have indeed reported for work. This doesn't match Barbarian's pattern. Also, if there is no murder case, then I'm afraid the police will really have to withdraw tomorrow. Upon hearing this, Brenda suddenly looked up at him. Just now, you said that the professors have all reported for work, but what about Peter himself? Aaron was taken aback. Peter and I have been contacting each other by cell phone all this time. I haven't seen him today but he was talking in the group chat early this morning. Brenda's movements as she ate became slower and slower and she could no longer hear all the voices around them. She suddenly asked, Peter was also a lecturer before he became the director, right? What did he teach? Aaron was stunned. He swallowed and answered, Biomedicine. Chapter 858 Capturing the Criminal The timing when they came for lunch happened to coincide with Epson. The students were busy with the experiments but Epson didn't need to do much, so he was free to go out for lunch. As soon as he entered, he saw the students around him all looking in one direction. He followed everyone's gaze and looked over to see the pair who stood out in the crowd in their uniforms. Epson curled his lips at once. He sneered and then walked over. What a coincidence, Captain Brenda, I didn't expect you guys to also come here for lunch. Why do you guys still have the time to eat, though? Didn't you say that the serial killer is in the school? Everyone has stopped their experiments to cooperate with the police, so shouldn't you guys be so busy catching the bad guys that you don't even have time to eat? Epson spoke sarcastically. Just as he was speaking, Brenda and Aaron pretty much only thought for two seconds before they jumped onto their feet. They moved so quickly that Epson got a shock. In particular, Brenda and Aaron had a fierce and savage look in their eyes at the moment, which scared Epson so badly that he took a step back and waved his arms in front of him. What are you doing? Captain Brenda, we're on campus now. I won't hold it against you for beating me up the last time, but there are so many students watching us now. If you dare. Before he could even finish, Brenda and Aaron sprinted out of the cafeteria at lightning speed. Epson. Epson. He stood where he was in confusion, puzzled about what the pair did just now. He frowned. At this moment, a student nearby came over and asked, Professor Epson, what just happened? What's up with those two? Epson thought for a moment and replied, I reprimanded them just now, so they must have suddenly woken up and come to their senses, I suppose. So they've gone to patrol and track down the murderer. I should think that the lockdown will be lifted soon. Besides, I reckon they must have also realized that it was not a serial killer who killed Professor Mayer, so they are too embarrassed to face us. Epson convinced even himself with his words. The students nearby all gave Epson a thumbs up. They said, Professor, you're really an educator in both morals and science. Not only do you impart us knowledge but you even taught those two some principles of life. Professor, your project will definitely succeed. You will definitely complete it faster than Auntie. 2. 11. After being flattered by the students a little, Epson got ahead of himself and said, Yeah, I think so too. Aha, uh -huh, you guys don't have to look at me like that, I just did what I should have. Elsewhere, after Brenda and Aaron sprinted out of the cafeteria, they went straight to the staff dormitories where the professors lived. The professors hadn't been allowed to go home, so Peter was also living there. While they were running, Brenda asked, when was the last time you saw Peter? Aaron replied, at 9 o'clock last night. We separated after we verified together that all the professors, except for Epson, had gone to the staff dormitory. Brenda broke into a frown. She took a deep breath and slowly said, Barbarian has a habit of killing between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. Therefore, it was possible that Peter had really been murdered. Aaron also became nervous. He picked up the walkie-talkie and spoke into it. He asked, Jabel, have you seen Professor Peter today? I exchanged a few text messages with him. Just half an hour ago, he was telling me that I can go to the cafeteria to eat. Aaron interrupted him. What I'm asking is have you seen him in person? The other party paused and then answered, no. Aaron took a deep breath and said, head to Professor Peter's room in the staff dormitory immediately. Roger. After hanging up, Brenda and Aaron sped up even more. The two were anxious to solve the case but even more eager to save Peter. While running, they didn't notice Solo and Nora coming out of the corner. 
At the sight of them, Solo immediately went after them. Nora also followed closely behind them. Solo said, judging from how they look, they have probably found something related to the suspect. Let's follow them and have a look. If we can help, then let's do so. Serial killers are too dangerous. Nora nodded. Yeah, Brenda resented Barbarian. After all, to her, Barbarian was the one who had killed Justin, but it wasn't like Nora could tell her the truth, either. Nora was worried that Brenda would take things too hard and end up forcing a fight with Barbarian. She had witnessed Barbarian's strength before. He was an extremely tough opponent. With that in mind, Nora quickened her pace. When Brenda and Aaron reached the staff dormitories, the two exchanged a look. Then, back to back, they rushed in. Both of them were holding their guns and had them aimed straight ahead. Brenda walked in front while Aaron followed behind her. As old partners, the two cooperated seamlessly. Just like that, they came right up to Peter's door. Brenda knocked on it. Immediately after, she gripped her handgun tightly and said, Professor Peter, I have something to talk to you about. Please open the door. Right after she spoke, she heard footsteps coming from the room. Brenda narrowed her eyes and exchanged a look with Aaron. Aaron took a deep breath. The person inside may be the murderer. Brenda also nodded. However, despite the movement inside, no one opened the door. Brenda put her hand on the door handle and tried to open it but couldn't. She looked at the anti-burglary lock on the door. At Stav University, professors' rooms were likely to contain their research materials, so each door was set up with digital locks. It was difficult to crack the password from the outside. Brenda did not have the password to Peter's room. She paused for a moment. Aaron pointed his handgun at the lock, intending to shoot. However, Brenda stopped him. She said, unless you have the password, you won't be able to break the lock even if you shoot at it. On the contrary, we may even alert the enemy. Aaron was anxious. But if we delay any longer, the person inside is gonna escape. Brenda's brows drew together. While she was thinking, a weak voice came over. I, I can open the lock for you. Upon hearing the voice, Brenda and Aaron turned their heads in unison to see Solo sticking to the wall like a weakling. Seeing the pair look over, he looked at Brenda ingratiatingly and said, I can open the lock for you guys. Give me ten seconds. Seiko. After speaking, he took out his cell phone and started to tap away. Seeing this, Brenda's pupils shrank. She abruptly reached over and grabbed Solo's phone. I don't need your help. Unfortunately, she was a step too late. When Solo offered to open the door's digital lock, he had already started to attack it. Right after Brenda spoke, the door opened with a clack. The person inside also appeared in front of everyone at this moment. Not expecting so many people to come rushing in, he seemed rather flustered. When he heard their voices, he immediately stood up. Don't move. Freeze. Put your hands up. Brenda and Aaron shouted at the same time and pointed their guns at him. Even Barbarian wouldn't be able to fight back against firearms. After all, the gene serum had only improved his physical fitness. It couldn't turn his skin into steel. Turn around. The tall and sturdy figure slowly turned around. It was a face that Nora was familiar with. Chapter 859 Why is Brenda ignoring Solo? Jack. Nora, who was behind the few of them, uttered in surprise. It was no wonder that she was surprised. After all, Jack's bright and sunny image was simply too out of line with Barbarian. Moreover, Nora had fought with Barbarian before back in New York, so she knew that he could not possibly be Barbarian. While she was thinking, Aaron rushed over. Together with Brenda, they cautiously grabbed Jack's arms, held them behind him, and arrested him. Jack, who looked rather flustered, exclaimed, What's the matter? What happened? Shit, you can't just arrest me without a reason. Both Brenda and Aaron also felt that things were going too smoothly and the two looked at each other. While Aaron held Jack down, Brenda cautiously circled the room. However, she did not see Peter at all. At the sight, Nora took the initiative to question Jack. She asked, why are you here? Jack. Jack, who was bent over due to being bound, answered, Professor Peter wanted me to clean his room. What's the matter with you guys? 
In university, many postgraduate students working under the professors also doubled as their assistants in their personal life. In fact, a fair number of professors even got their postgraduate students to pick up their children from school for them. Therefore, situations like what Jack was claiming did exist. However, he had a very flustered look in his eyes, so it was obvious at a glance that he was lying. Aaron immediately held him down even more forcefully, which made Jack feel as if his arm was going to break. He shouted, You can't treat me like this. I'm a student of Stav University. What gives you the right to treat me like this? Aaron's expression darkened even further when he said that. Nora said, If you don't tell the truth, I'm afraid we won't be able to help you, Jack. Jack pressed his lips together when he heard her. Nora nodded to Aaron. Aaron slowly let go of Jack, but nevertheless continued to point his handgun at him warily. If Jack was barbarian, even if all three and a half humans present teamed up solo could only be regarded as half a person here, they still wouldn't be his match. Therefore, Aaron and Brenda did not dare to let down their guard one bit. Jack stood up straight and shook his arm, which had become numb from being held down. Only then did the young man, who was close to tears, say, I was doing Professor Peter's work for him, he said that he should have been taking care of this by himself, so he didn't want me to tell anyone about it. As soon as he said that, the rest understood. Why, Jack had been the one handling all the work, including verifying the professor's attendance in the group chat since the morning, not Peter. Aaron broke into a huge frown and asked, where's Peter? Jack shrugged. I don't know. Why would the director ever tell me where he's going? Aaron looked at Brenda. Brenda suddenly took a step forward and attacked Jack, which scared him so badly that he immediately retreated. Even so, he did not manage to dodge her attack. There was no sign of an act in his actions. Brenda said, he's not barbarian. Only then did the fierce and menacing look on Aaron's face ease. The way he looked just now was as if barbarian had killed his father. Nevertheless, he was furious. When did you start handling these affairs for him? And when was the last time you saw him? Although Jack was displeased at being punched for some inexplicable reason, he nevertheless answered Aaron's questions honestly. He replied, at 10 o'clock last night. When I left this place, I told him that I would come over at 6 this morning to continue helping him with his work. Aaron asked, didn't you see him when you came here this morning? No. Jack replied, he was already gone when I came. He usually gets up at 5.30 for morning runs and then he takes his breakfast after it. I was also wondering why he isn't back yet and was just about to call him. Aaron noticed something suspicious. How did you get in if Peter wasn't here? Jack was confused. I have the password to Professor Peter's room. I come here every morning to clean up when he goes for his morning run. Is something the matter? His explanation was flawless. There was no problem with Jack's answers. Nora also frowned. After circling around the room, Brenda finally took a deep breath and said, Peter has been murdered. Both Aaron and Jack looked at her in shock. Jack blurted out, how can that be? Brenda took out a poker card. This is Barbarian's calling card. He leaves a poker card like this behind whenever he appears. Here's the question, though, where is Peter's body? She looked straight at Aaron. Retrieve the surveillance footage. Aaron nodded. The night before, they had spent the whole time keeping a watch on the staff dormitory. There was no way anyone could enter the room without them knowing. There must be something wrong in here. Soon, Aaron retrieved the surveillance footage and started checking it on his cell phone. Everything had gone well the night before. Except for a few students, no one had gone to Peter's room. There was no trace of Barbarian having ever entered. After going through it once, Brenda said, Barbarian typically kills at night between 10 and 4. Let's slow down the video and watch the footage for those 6 hours again. Okay. Aaron replayed the video. They had sped through the video at 20 times the original speed just now. This time, they slowed it down and watched it carefully. Nora suddenly noticed something amiss. She was about to speak when Solo suddenly tugged at her sleeve. Nora immediately understood and closed her mouth. Solo was intending to display his professional expertise. It was just like how Nora hadn't offered to unlock the door for them just now, because there was Solo. Sure enough, 
Solo said, look at the part at five minutes past midnight. Brenda was taken aback. Aaron's fingers also paused slightly but he still reversed the video to the part at 5 minutes past midnight. Solo pointed to the video and said, the time flow here is not quite right. A hacker has likely covered up something here. Look here. A very professional Solo pointed out something odd. The reflection of the moon outside the window was at this position at 11 p.m. It should have changed its direction after midnight but this part here stayed the same the whole time and never changed. Aaron and Brenda were stunned for a moment and they both looked at Solo. Solo continued. This shows that their hacker has masked the part after midnight with the footage from 11 p.m., so as to prevent you guys from noticing anything unusual. Aaron hurriedly asked, is there any way to restore the surveillance footage at 12 o'clock? Solo shook his head. That's where they were really brilliant. The surveillance footage after 12 o'clock has been fully masked, which means that the camera was turned off at midnight. Therefore, even if you discover something amiss, you won't be able to find the original video anymore because it was never recorded. If the video was never recorded, then even if they had a master hacker on their side, it would still be impossible for them to recover. It, after all, how was one supposed to recover something that had never existed? Solo subconsciously said, the guy is very cautious. It feels like he knows that you have hackers on your side, so he is guarding against that. Hackers. As soon as Solo said that, Brenda suddenly looked at Nora. Nora also narrowed her eyes. No. Between Q and Y, only her identity had been publicly announced, so the other party did not know that Y was Justin. Besides, even Nora couldn't say for sure whether Justin was here or not, let alone the other party. Therefore, she was the one whom they were guarding against. In other words, Barbarian was already aware that Nora was here. Nora frowned. Once again, she was acutely feeling just how tough the enemy was. Barbarian's overwhelmingly powerful fighting abilities coupled with Spacey, whose hacking skills might be comparable to hers, could she really beat a combination like that and get the V-16? While Nora was thinking, Brenda had already sorted out her thoughts. She looked straight at Aaron and said slowly, the most important thing for us now is to find Peter's body as soon as possible, so that we can prove that I am speaking the truth, or else the president is going to kick us out tomorrow. In addition, the students and professors are all intellectuals with minds of their own. They will never let us confine them here for ten days or half a month. Aaron nodded but said anxiously, but where is the body? We don't have any clues at all. Brenda said, the whole campus was closed off last night, so they definitely can't transport the body out. The body must still be within school premises. Aaron nodded again. Okay, I'll send someone to look for it right away. Even if we must turn the whole school upside down, we will find the body. After that, Aaron made a phone call and dispatched his men to look for the body. But after he hung up the phone, he saw an extremely grave look on Brenda's face. What's wrong? Aaron asked. A grim-faced Brenda replied, We have been investigating suspicious people the whole time since yesterday, but even until now, we still haven't found any clues. Barbarian is a living, breathing person. We've also reminded the students to be careful if they spot any strangers. Although the school is big, the student population is dense, yet no one has spotted any strangers even until now. Do you know what this means? Aaron shook his head. Before Brenda could speak, Nora replied on her behalf. She said, Barbarian is either a student or a teacher in the school. Her one-liner was akin to a thunderous explosion in their ears. Everyone looked at her in stunned disbelief. Brenda nodded. She said, yes, Nora is right. I always thought that Barbarian was all brawn and no brains but it's only now that I've realized that he is actually very clever. No wonder he instantly disappeared the moment we found even a tiny lead on him all these years. Nora, however, said, there is another possibility, though. Brenda looked at her. What is it? In a low voice, Nora slowly answered, someone is helping Barbarian. Spacey, the genius with the high IQ. When Solo said just now that the other party had hackers on their side, she'd immediately thought of Spacey. If Barbarian wasn't blindly acting in a reckless and foolhardy manner at the moment, then this meant that the highly intelligent Spacey must be giving him advice and guidance. 
Spacey's IQ genes had been improved, so he must be highly intelligent. As for Barbarian, his physical fitness had been improved, so he was extremely strong. The two, teaming up, made for an even more terrifying enemy than Barbarian alone. Brenda nodded solemnly. After the two spoke, the room suddenly fell into silence. After a while, Brenda recovered and said, All right, Nora, we are going to continue with the case. You guys can go now. Solo, however, said, Brenny, I'm not leaving, I can stay and help you. Look at how much help I was to you just now, you. Before he could finish, though, Brenda cut him off. She said, what can you even help with? Do you think you'll be of help to us just by mouthing off some nonsense? Hurry up and leave, I don't want to see you. You're just a pretty boy who only knows how to freeload. Go away. Solo paled when he heard her. He didn't expect Brenda to say such things just to drive him away. He gave her a resigned smile and said, Brenny, I'm a hacker. I solved the technical problems for you just now. If someone hacks into the system again tonight, at least I'll be able to find out. Why are you? Hacker. I don't know what you're talking about, you are just a programmer. Please don't pester me anymore, okay? Go away. Brenda pointed at the door and yelled at him. Solo was stunned again. He wanted to say something but Nora had already turned around. She said dispassionately, let's go. Solo was not afraid of Brenda, but he was afraid of Nora. That big boss wasn't very even-tempered. Although he still had a lot to say to Brenda, when he glanced at Nora from the back, he chose to follow after Nora. Even after Solo stepped out, he was perplexed. Does Brenny hate me that much? But why? Nora looked behind her at the people in the room. Suddenly, she said, leave this place. Solo was taken aback. Auntie, are you also not on my side anymore? Do you also think I'm a good for nothing? There is obviously a misunderstanding between Brenny and me, we have to resolve it and talk things out properly. We love each other, I'm not willing to just let go of her like that. Besides, you saw just now that I can really be of help to her. Although my computer skills are not as good as yours, I'm still a well-known hacker. Nora was about to interrupt him when Aaron suddenly came out of the room. He stared at Solo and suddenly said, When you said that your name was Solo, I didn't think much about it. Are you the hacker Solo? Yes, yes, that's right. Solo nodded. I'm Solo the hacker. I can be of help to you, really. Go and tell Captain Brenda to let me stay. Solo had completely forgotten that he was currently wanted by Interpol. As soon as he said that though, Aaron laughed and said, So, you are Solo. What a coincidence. Yes, what a coincidence, right? There can't be a bigger coincidence than this. Although I'm not as strong or muscular as you, I'm still useful, right? Solo vaguely found the value of his existence. So, you. Aaron suddenly stepped forward, grabbed Solo's arms, and held them behind him. Solo. Just as he was at a total loss, Aaron cast his eyes down and said coldly, We were looking for you all over the world, but to think you present yourself right on our doorstep. Solo was taken aback. Then, he shouted nervously, Hey bro, I didn't do anything bad. This is just a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding, I say, Brenny, come out and save me. Despite his shouts, Brenda didn't step out of the room. Aaron let out a low scoff and said, I thought you and Captain Brenda were just having a petty lover's quarrel, I didn't expect this at all. I finally understand why she's ignoring you now. Solo was not at all anxious about being arrested anymore. On the contrary, he asked, what have you understood? Hurry and tell me, I'm at a total loss. Why is she asking to break up when nothing happened? What am I doing wrong? Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe before more videos.